we're ready now. Hello, and welcome to the second week of Design Forum 1984. Well, last week we inaugurated uh, the series by having Doug Michaels perform his music architecture, where Doug laid a, a parody to the theme of the architect as the media star, and then he turned himself into uh, literally a rock and roll star for us last week with a band. And this being part of his performance of the postmodern hoax. Tonight's lecturer, uh, William Bruder, is not about parody or hoaxes. He is the real thing. He's from Arizona, and he builds lots of architecture. He's young, and I hope he's a good role model to our students here at SciArc. Next week, Peter Calthorpe will be here to present a major retrospective of his last 14 years' work. This will be next Wednesday at 8 o'clock in this space. I'd now like to introduce to you in the audience the dean and founder of SciArc and also the founder of our new Institute for Future Studies, Raymond Cappy. Thank you. I, I used to be the director. I guess I've been upgraded. <laughs> Uh, about a year ago, I got a phone call, and the person on the other end of the line said, uh, this is Will Bruder. I'm going to be in L.A. in about a week. Uh, I'd like to stop by and talk to you. And uh, can I have a few minutes? And I said, sure. And he said, I'm interested in seeing what you're doing these days. And uh, about a week later, Will came by with a friend. And we started talking, and I, this was the first time I had met him. I think he, had, he said he had been through the house once before, and we sat, and those few minutes turned into quite a few hours. And it seemed that we had quite a bit in common, and I really enjoyed uh, this particular young architect. And while we were talking, he said, I put together an exhibit that I've, uh, that's going to be in uh, exhibit in Arizona, and it would Syark would be interested in having this exhibit. And I said, about when? He said, probably in the spring. And I said, that would probably work out very well because we're in the fall, the, the program is pretty well put together. And by spring, uh, the, we could use an exhibit and, and uh, I'd be interested in seeing you know, your full work. He showed me a little bit of his work and I hadn't really been familiar that much before with Will. Uh, so. My feeling was, knowing that we had an, a, a program that was going to feature primarily uh, young architects from the East and some of the other stars from the West, that possibly somebody who would be working like Will uh, in, a in a neighboring state, Arizona, which we, who, a state where most of you don't see work from too often because we're so inundated by uh, the magazines that, that constantly show us work from other places, whether it be Europe or the East Coast, or sometimes, as I say, from the West Coast, but not too much from Arizona. And I thought it would be maybe a welcome relief to have someone like Will, who really doesn't talk as much about his architecture as he does architecture. Uh, this year is really, as he told me today, is his 10th anniversary of being in practice. And so in 10 years, he's produced about 200 pieces of work. Uh, most people produce about two these days in that same period of time. And so it's really rather phenomenal uh, for any young architect to produce that kind of work, uh, at least in, in my mind. I, I thought I did a lot of work when I was a young man. I probably produced about oh, 60, 70 jobs in that same period of time, and I always sort of patted my back, myself on the back for having done that much work. So we have a very energetic young architect tonight that's going to uh, present his work. And Will actually came through a process, which I've learned recently, having, once having become acquainted with him, 
seeing his work in Toshi Jutaku and then just this month in the AIA Journal, he was interviewed as one of six from the 60s uh, by another architect uh, who, or writer who decided to go back and see what happened to all these guys that were growing up with all these ideals in the 60s. And uh, Will was one of these people and, and uh, he was interviewed at that time. I got to know a little bit more about him through that interview and I'd like to share that for a few minutes because I don't know if he'll talk about himself. Uh, <clears throat> Will was not educated st strictly in architecture. He was always interested in architecture. Uh, be started, began by working for an architect. He, he originally was going to go work for a GM and, and design cars and decided he didn't like that uh, particular process. Decided to come back to his home state, I think of Wisconsin, and uh, I guess decided he would go to IIT. This, this was always a strange one for me to hear because it's interesting to know what this guy would have been like if he had ever gone to IIT. But instead he decided to go to Wisconsin, which didn't have an architecture school, and take engineering classes and art classes and graduated uh, with a sculpture degree at the same time as he was working for architects uh, while doing this. And then instead of going on to graduate school somewhere, he decided to get his feet wet and become, uh, and started to really look at the work of architects rather than studying architecture. And he became obviously very involved with Frank Lloyd Wright, with uh, Bruce Goff, worked with Soleri, then later went to work for Gunnar Burkitz, decided he liked the warm weather better, went back to Arizona, and uh, really went to work full blast. Uh, he, the way he had called me on the phone, I think, is the way he deals in architecture. He meets people, he sees their work, he cares about their work, he shares his work. It's a very uh, special kind of an arrangement, I think, uh, that most people uh, just don't do. He's a, an architect who really goes at it. He throws himself into it. He has a hell of a lot of energy. He produces and produces and produces, and I think he learns by producing. And uh, I think it's a treat to see this kind of work in relationship to uh, the kind of thing that we have been seeing. And I'm not putting down what we've been seeing. I think it's another way of looking at architecture. Uh, it's very much the way people look at, at, at their work today. They, they like to really talk about it, look into it, uh, take, you know, uh, spend a lot of words. And tonight, I, I think we're in for less words and a lot more visuals. Will Bruder. Thank you very much for that, that introduction. <laughs> um, I guess that gives a pretty good background and um, to where it's sort of been at in some respects. I'm, I like architecture, I like to build. I'm very interested in architecture as an art form and yet architecture has a commitment beyond pure sculpture and in my way of thinking in that there's a, a certain user sensitivity to, to function and to need. And I think as an architect, the responsibility be, becomes not just doing drawings or exercises or building ugly buildings or building beautiful buildings, but building buildings that work for people, work for their sites, work for their environments, and without that harmony, it's all for naught. So as I've observed many times in listening to architects, sometimes without visuals, I get all jazzed up about the words and I think, my God, I gotta see this, you know. I'm, some very prominent architects I've heard speak in the past. I've waited with bated breath to see illustration of what they're talking about. And it's funny, we all say similar words, and yet when you see the work, it can be very, very different. So with that, let's get on to some visuals, and I'll sort of have a running dialogue on the work that you're going to be seeing, which is a cross-section of some of the things that have happened during the last 10 years. After that, I'd be happy to entertain any questions that you might have. And uh, after that, the exhibit's over there and I'll be happy to talk to you over there when that happens. Um, so if I could have this, let's see, I guess, slides, please. Um, as Ray indicated in the summary, I went back to the desert with my wife in 1970 and had, okay, my degree was in sculpture. I, it was an intentional thing that I had been working in a good office and I didn't see anything really rewarding coming out of architectural schools. I chose a course of sculpture. I think a fine art background is very important. I think a sensitivity and awareness to all the arts is critical for an architect. 
I don't think you can ignore it and really do your art and be an architect. Uh, I came back to the desert in 1970. I still had two more years of apprenticeship to go before I could take my licensing exam. Uh, I ended up taking it the same day as somebody that had gone through a conventional process. It was eight, eight years to the day that gave me credit for working with Paulo, who was not registered, a couple other registered people, unregistered people. It was fortunate I put together a little package and I was sitting there taking the exam and got my license. And, and I was commenting when I woke up this morning, I guess it is just 10 years ago today that I opened my studio. Prior to that, in the 70s already, I started doing moonlight projects. And this was a little interior renovation for a tile company, a ceramic tile company, and it played against the 30, 60 degree module, uh, simple geometry of the carpeted couch, the panelized system of hollow core doors and rabbited jams uh, put together in the maze, and it became a just very low cost solution to a display network for a, a tile contractor. Your work should get you more work. That should be the, the generation of architecture. If your work has validity and has meaning and has purpose, it should get you more work. And the people that did that little tile showroom lived a block and a half away from this house, you know, sort of a Greenbelt, California type area, an old neighborhood of uh, Phoenix with a sort of English house on it. And there were a husband and wife arguing in the backyard about how they should put a, a shade trellis over that backyard. Well, it was an odd shaped lot and an odd geometry to it. And so I just interlaced this little 45 degree triangular scheme. The husband wanted to cut down the tree that goes through the trellis. The wife wanted to keep it. And the way the module dropped out, the tree survives, the, enhances the whole situation. In the desert, there's a material that's as important to me as any desert material, and that's light. I like to manipulate shade and shadow. I like to make the light sort of a fantasy thing, a fun thing, a friendly thing, rather than the enemy that it can be when it's 120 degrees out. The patio is developed into a little series of patios, and it's a funny thing when somebody knows you do a patio and you, they see a little newspaper article or a clipping somewhere, you're a patio architect, right? And unfortunately, people don't always have a lot of imagination for you, so you get a call and it's for a patio. It's never for that library or that new house necessarily. And I had sort of fun with a whole series and still do patios occasionally. It's a fun little project. This was a patio for a lady that was about four foot 11 tall, liked to do a lot of gardening, and so it was a series of raised terraced planters the main supports became sandblasted concrete block sewer pipe, the little 10-foot round fender board cylinder as a potting shed. Again, function generates architecture for me. This becomes a patio for a little gourmet restaurant on the east side of Phoenix. It was an outdoor entertainment area for a folk singer, etc., and cocktails. Played together with a little tinker toy system that had growth potential, a series of little pyramids of, of shade mesh. The rotating fans were used in summer. They dropped out and became an infrared gas heater in winter. So you had the double function use of the space. Sort of a little metabolist expressionism there with the fins going out. The thing could have just grown like a tinker toy all across this little garden site. I like to express the elements of architecture and how they're put together. I like to celebrate things like conduits and ducts in a fine art way. I like materials like plywood and corrugated metal, much as some of your mentors over here. However, I don't do it for thrill's sake, okay? It's not for shock value, it's not for impact. I consider them sacred materials as well as marble would be. I don't use them just to shock somebody. I use them for aesthetics that I feel, oops, oops. Okay, this is a, Another one of the patio series, a little diagonal grid coming off a standard tract house with a 3 and 12 pitch roof, played with that angle, floated the trellis out above it. The diagonals of the trellis members were laid down into the sandblasted concrete block pavers with the redwood headers down below. A six foot round cattle tank becomes a fountain which spills into two spillways down either perimeter to give the sound of cool and water next to the Desert Mountain Preserve area in the city. Two patios, the little old bald man there that's serving hors d'oeuvres in the right hand, no, let's see, it's your right-hand slide uh, is Lester Nunn. He was a retired chef from Lake Tahoe in his mid-60s. Okay, he came over while I was pounding nails and helping on that first 45-degree triangular patio you saw and was, was taken with it. It was sort of interesting. Kitty Corner across the street from that house, which was English Tudor sort of, was a little French provincial house. They had a grass in the backyard. And he said, what can we do back here? The little outdoor patio and dining environment on the left developed from that. And since then, whenever they, they sort of move, she's in real estate, so they continually move, and they have this sort of very eclectic taste, and yet they have these, sort of these, this other strange taste in, that happens in the backyard, and I did the subterranean environment or that sunken environment on the right-hand slide a couple years ago. 
amazingly energetic old fellow. It's, uh, I can't keep up with him with details. It's, uh, you present the preliminaries and he's got it laid out and he's ready to dig before you get a chance to even to mention them. So it's lucky you draw to scale. And then it's uh, keep up time because he always has a deadline of some of the kids are coming for Christmas and this is already October so we got to have the project done and he proceeds to, to just wail along on it. A couple other shade solutions, the left one's a west facing sun solution next to Squaw Peak Mountain. Uh, little uh, light detail out of a paint can lid and some galvanized uh, pipe and G40 bulb or G25 with a clear bulb. A uh, little rotating matrix on a um, trellis over on the right hand side where I split a steel pipe, a quarter inch steel well casing pipe, painted the inside of that bright orange and then got the engagement of this fan shaped trellis structure next to the swimming pool. A before and after. Uh, where do clients come from? Why do they come? Who knows? You know, again, uh, work generates. The program for this house was fairly basic. Uh, wanted privacy in the backyard. Uh, right just past that yellow uh, umbrella there was the fence. So it's a typical narrow tract yard, originally a split level tract house, $28,000 house. Uh, we started out, it was a do-it-yourself project. And the trellis work to the left that's overgrown with the cat claw vine was the first project. The owner had never really done anything like this before. Next thing I knew, I showed him how to lay things out, worked with him building the first bend. And uh, he was working under lights, and this was a lot of fun. And so he came back in fall, and we proceeded to do the cantilevered balcony, which is led to by the cylindrical tube steps at the, the side there, and the hot tub area. And it became the start of a relationship that's gone on now for 11 years, and we'll build together all our lives. Uh, all my clients sort of, uh, they become friends, they become really patrons in a way. Uh, I venture to say that many of my clients know more than any of you here about architecture, and that's a pretty big statement. But uh, this man's probably seen buildings in LA that you don't even know exist. And that just comes from a very basic background of, uh, I had an architect friend that came here when I was in my early phases of working on these patios, and he said, how can you work for such insensitive clients as we walk through a wallpaper clad living room with you know, yellow flowers, et cetera. And yet there's growth, there's development. The client is an opportunity. The client is coming to you for something that they cannot see or do themselves necessarily and you know you become a next step for them. That's again the responsibility in my mind of an architect. Here you can say that, see the manipulation of light through the various trellis members, the bender board, the last strips, the shade mesh. Uh, little things like the details. We took some scrap wood and made the light fixtures that uh, flow around this project. You can see the cylindrical tube uh, staircase up to the cantilevered balcony off the original master bedroom of the house. And we had a little bit of land left in the back corner of this odd cul-de-sac cul shaped lot. And so we got to chatting, what should we do, right, next adventure. So we made up this sort of excuse that we needed sort of a home office in Dan, and we proceeded over the course of two years to build this little concrete sculpture. You can see we're within three foot of the setback in the backyard. And one of the little ventures, you'll see a couple little buildings for a thing called Ucard Concrete in some of the future slides. That Rocky was so impressed with pouring his little concrete footings on the first pot patio, he bought a little concrete company. And so he liked concrete, so we wanted to do something in concrete. And uh, like I say, we had a lot of fun for, for several years. Here you can see the forming going on, the rough structure. You can see the view into the neighbor's yards at that point. Right now, there's a 14-foot high bamboo hedge forming a virtually garden oasis. This could be anywhere in the world in a way. And that's the environment that's developed. There's eight inches of sod on the roof. The building's a little solar trap facing south. It's sunken down two foot eight into the landscape. You can see you walk down into it in a second and you walk across the reflecting pool with the koi fish in the water garden. And in Arizona, this is a pretty pleasant retreat from the heat. It's a very um, sort of contrast to that environment and yet it's sympathy with that environment. You come down on the side here, the board formed circle at the left is a little toilet room and wet bar. The main roof support is the striated uh, hollow cylinder which contains a fireplace and skylight. Here you walk across some of the round tubes I'd used before. And in a bunch of these projects, you know, I never knew when these people hired me to do a $2,500 back patio cover that anything was going to happen or develop. We've since proceeded to rework the house, and you'll see a scheme over the, uh, in the uh, exhibit of that same Hallcraft house that you saw a couple minutes ago wrapped in corrugated metal uh, a year and a half before Frank Geary wrapped his. Uh, here's a view across the garden. You can see the radio, the geometry, again, based on function of the desk area there, the cantilevered oak desk on the stainless steel shaft, and the, the, the functional relation of the space called for this asymmetric relationship of the roof, and that sort of gives it, I think, its specialness and its fairly unique quality. Interesting illusion at night, um, 
pleases very, very much. I've been in a lot of buildings, but with the play of geometry here, we've got the butt glazed half inch uh, glass on both facades. There's no door frames on those big pivoting oak doors. And so you've got a, a very transparency. It's very minimal detailing in a way. We've got either concrete or stainless steel or glass. And in reflection at night, whereas you're totally aware of this outside environment during the daytime, at night you're, you're surrounded by these floating moons in the glass and you're suddenly in a total circular environment. And it's a pretty special place. And, you know, it's an office, it's a playroom, it's where the kids have friends come, it's a guest room, it's a, it's a major retreat for, for this, this couple. There you can see our fireplace engaged into the, the contrast again and the tension between the stainless and the, and the, the rough concrete. I like concrete a lot, it's a, it's a nice material. Before and after. A uh, little basement remodel that I did for that uh, little chef from Lake Tahoe as uh, one of our side projects was published in Sunset and suddenly people knew I could do remodels. So I got a series of calls for remodels. I was suddenly a remodel architect. Uh, as a result of that, the people that lived in the house on the left uh, called me and they had some basic functional problems of darkness and light. They liked uh, plants. They wanted to open their environment up and that became the house then on the right. It's a, about a six-year project, a $10,000 budget for what you see in this renovation. And it's just grown, and again, another client that's become friend and more. Same view again. We had four foot to go to the legal setback in this case. And in that setback, I developed this sort of glazed entry system. Those little strips that you see horizontally are actually inch and a half horizontal windows. Uh, again, what are people's roots in architecture? You know, I. I like to think I know quite a bit about architecture and, let you, and yet then you sort of put it in the back of your mind. You get a new project and then you just fly, you just grow, it's there and it's on recall, but you're not conscious of it. Uh, you know, sometimes before it gets to this stage, sometimes after, all of a sudden you'll think or you'll remember something and I don't know how many of you here are familiar with John Lautner's early work, but there's a house that he did, I think back in the late 40s, early 50s, that is a manipulation on horizontal slot glazing and some heavy timbers with this little clay. And I can remember seeing that house way back. And in a way, here's, here's a generation of it. You know, I can take you and through my buildings, and there's buildings dedicated to Macintosh and Schindler. I was up in a, the Howe House up in the Silver Lake District one day. And there's a ceiling you'll see here, and if you're familiar at all with Schindler's work, it's a play on that. It's a little homage. I've got my folk heroes just like everybody else. I, I guess maybe I've got different standards than some of the, the, the postmodernist uh, standards. This is the view of the entry as you come into it. Again, the transition, you don't know whether you're inside or outside. Uh, the flow comes in. You have a little bay window there, which is a greeting. The, the lady's a uh, gourmet cook, and that bay window's off the kitchen. So often when you come there as a guest, she'll be preparing a very exotic meal for you, and it's a friendly way for her to greet you. As you come into the space here, you can see what's happening. A lot of giveaways, a lot of clues. I think an important part of remodel work becomes conceptual thought, OK? If a remodel is to succeed, it has to have a concept. Without a concept, it's just going to be a ticky-tacky interior decorator cosmetic job. So you've got to really get a concept of architecture and flow going, I think, for any sort of, beyond any architecture. I mean, that's without saying. But remodel, I think it's almost more sensitive to that, that issue. Uh, the one element you have in a remodel situation, other than a natural topography and the location of the sun and a site and trees and all that good stuff, is you've really got a question of another geography, another geology on the property, and in this case it was the house you saw a couple minutes ago. In that geology or, or, or background, I had a fireplace element, which was fairly interesting on the inside, out of context uh, somewhat to the outside. Had an interesting start on a flagstone floor, and I had this beamed roof structure. Had six coats of paint on, the latest one being sort of light eyes green. And when we proceeded to sandblast it, I found a very nice, basic red wooden first structure sort of played with that. The, the addition starts right at that floating sandblasted steel channel that supports the pivoting copper panels. That's where the real remodel started. They wanted light into the house and consequently I developed a 70, well it started out as a 20 foot long skylight trough and I like to play with mechanical and express them sculpturally and detail them out and refine them, just not let them hang out but think about them. And the, the idea was, I'm, hey, I'm ripping open the center of this house, want to get some light, I'll, I'll run the duct between those uh, 24 foot element, get some light in. Owner was so taken with the idea, the next thing I knew, we had a 70 foot long insulated skylight instead of 24 foot. And the whole mechanical system ex expressed over two toilet rooms and the circulation of the house, and it became a pretty dominant element. Uh, the pivoting copper panels, there you see. But this, to the right of that duct, is, is the new work. And I used the cue of that nicely pitched and nicely scaled roof, stepped down into the sunken couch area at the, the south end of the space for a scale transition. 
but used the same rough pitch, basically imitated that front roof structure. Again, context, relationship to this house. Totally owner built, perfection of craftsmanship. This house, I would venture to say, if I had bid it the way it's detailed, should have cost the remodel in excess of $100,000. You know, we're quite closely, very, very near $10,000. The oak cabinet work there is all white oak. The step down set, those flip up, and that's the stereo and media center focused around that lowered area. The idea of the copper pivoting panels was to divide two zones, one around the, the media happenings, one around the fireplace with a growing family. And there you can see the back area with the, the cat Freddy now. Uh, their kids got together, they happened to see this little remodel. They just saw the drawing even, the remodel hadn't even started at this point. This house is two blocks away from the King residence, which you just saw on the previous slide. I drove up to the house you see at the left. They just added the little garage, which you see at the, the left in the, the slide with the, the new mailbox and the lights going towards the walk. And another happening developed. This becomes a shade oasis on the north side here to get you out of that hot summer sun. And then expression, I got into a little truss period here, and I did a whole series of little trusses playing around with circles and trusses. And they're two by fours with a little threaded rod connection. And I like to play and experiment with engineering. That's a, a fun part of architecture for me. I think it's expressive of, of what architecture is, and there's a lot of art in it. Okay, this is a patio situation for a spin-off from a patio article. And I, some people had bought a house very quickly, a standard little tract house in the central area of Phoenix, more or less, and had a terrible west sun problem. They had a lot of vegetation in that backyard, and consequently I didn't want to cut down any of the trees because there was a, an interesting basic thing there. So by juxtaposing the circular geometry of these trellises in the backyard, I saved every tree that was there. If I had gone with any other sort of gridded system, all those trees you see threading up through this structure would have been lost. You've got a buffer garden here in the foreground on the left-hand slide between a family room patio and a, uh, a master bedroom patio. And uh, sort of a, a man-made trees inter interlocking with the juxtaposition with the, the real trees. The six smaller ones are covered over with a fabric which is used on Samsonite outdoor furniture, which is a nice yellow cast to it. The columns are held down in that case, and you get an indirect spotlight at night on rheostat, so they become floating clouds of light in the evening. Uh, it was a combination of contractor doing concrete, architect setting steel, laying out the jigging of the prefab elements for the carpentry, and owner proceeding to finish carpentry. I don't work in normal methods necessarily. I like to build. Okay, that patio was on the house at the left. A couple of years afterwards, I came by just to see how things were doing and where it was at, and the people said, hey, you want to put a fireplace in our family room? No problem. Um, <laughs> proceeded to go to a programming meeting and they had decided, as many people do, that they like their neighborhood. Hey, the kids like the school district, it's close to the husband's work, uh, we like belonging to the Biltmore and going swimming there in summer, let's stay. And as the option becomes for many people, they decided, let's remodel. Okay, again, a concept. I had no idea when I started screwing around with all the circles in the backyard that anything was going to happen, right? I was relating to a subject. So in playing against that, I developed these curving masonry masses that float through the new scheme. You can see the mountain in the background there, and the, the rough pitch, and there you can see the plan. Standard tract house plan. Okay, three bedroom ranch, uh, slump block face, shake shingle roof, and uh, the kitchen was a corridor. So a lot of basic functional problems, okay? So in doing that, in looking at the situation, I took the eight spaces in the center, blew out the ceiling, and developed one big sculpt sculptural living space. Redefined the bedrooms on the right-hand side of the slide, the two bedrooms became three by just extending three foot to the natural eave line, so I didn't have to worry about introducing leaks and extending roofs, and popped a little bay off the master bedroom for a den, popped a little bay off the existing garage to turn it into a graphic studio, and extended a carport out to protect the cars, with the car, what the garage had originally done. Curved form for bike storage and firewood, curved courtyard to enter, curved fireplace hearth wall, thermal mass wall with storage behind, carries you through to the geometry of the back circles. Uh, details. Details are important. Uh, we might all have our uh, grudge matches with Mies. I think personally every city should have had the, had the honor of one Mies building. I don't think a hundred copies or a thousand copies by Skidmore or anybody else should have followed. But there's a certain specialness about a Mies building. Um, think about that when you're in a city with one. There's something special there. I came into Toronto on a bus at sunrise when I was hawking for a job when I got done with school and I saw the uh, Dominion Towers and there was something special about the proportion. There was something special about the magic, and when you see it close, there's something special, although not maybe as pure as Mies would have liked to have thought about his details. Here, the old American flag uh, 
gas lamp at the front suddenly became a little sculpture which plays with the other geometries as well as the mailbox. Uh, the garage form over there becomes a clear storage studio and you come into the entry. Uh, number three pine board spaced with tar paper above for acoustic reasons form the vault of the ceiling. Here I just ran the duct as needed spanning this new high ceiling space from one side of the house to the other. Curving dry stack uh, sand textured block, the little sculptural fireplace. In this open space functionally once it was determined that you didn't win in the family by turning your media happening as high as the volume would go to kill the other guy, you scaled your volume down you had this husband able to sit in those leather lounge chairs and listen to the Phoenix Suns, the kids listening to the uh, whatever they were on the TV, and the wife listening to the stereo in her kitchen all in one open room. Again, it's a sensitivity, it's a different awareness of happening. I like natural materials. I don't stain wood. I like to celebrate materials, be it uh, AC plywood, be it rough text plywood, be it sound deadening boards as the art surface there where the kids' art is or their fine art print collection. Uh, materials should be celebrated. They should be treated with craft. Uh, I get frustrated seeing Gary's house in that you don't know the craft exists. Again, it's, there's a certain degree of craftsmanship and yet I don't think it's taken to the degree of elegance and detail that I know I, and think he has the potential of doing. And maybe that's not part of the game, but on the one hand it's a very, it is. Uh, here you have the storage wrapping around the, the back of the the, that masonry wall and here the kitchen suddenly becomes a dead end element where everybody can work out of galvanized sliding uh, metal cabinet doors, uh, inlaid marble tops for pastry, uh, oak flooring for the countertops, a little custom uh, galvanized hood. I like to have fun with things like that. That's, that's what architecture is about. Okay, it turns out then that I went into a house about two years later, somebody that went backpacking with King's daughter, saw it drove the mother dropped off the kid at King's house, had to go in and see what that was all about, and suddenly I have another job to do. I walk into this house, and I'm walking through it. It had a red brick facade with some colonial columns. It's in a totally different site orientation, totally different family, and I get into the bedroom wing, and I say, hey, I've been in this house before. Turns out it was the same floor plan as the house you saw on this previous slides. Same floor plan as the lost. It was a popular plan back in the late 60s. And yet, totally different set of circumstances result in a totally different solution. Uh, you know, construction's a mess. There's a definite commitment with the owner builders who I have many of to live with the mess that you see in the right hand slide for many years often. This has been almost a 10 year project. We're 99% complete right now. The major concept here became a material and a form. You've got the S shaped wall flowing through the space in sandblasted concrete block, forming a generator of movement, of motion, a retreat from the west sun at the west exposure as an entry court the return on the back side becoming a master bedroom court, small cantilevered triangular fireplace that you see under construction on the right in the master bedroom, a larger version of that growing out of the wall mid-span more or less. Uh, wanted a quiet zone so that little esh or question shaped wood element is a what we call the womb room which is a very low scaled intimate space, very warm, blew out the roof of the house, this had shake shingle roof too, it leaks like a sieve, doesn't make any sense in the desert. We replaced it with galvanized metal on this house but the triangular form gave a high volume, a different focus. Uh, wanted to tie in this sort of weird shaped swimming pool in the back backyard into the geometry of this new idea. And so it was in my truss period, so I did these 50 foot long two by four trusses across the swimming pool and they formed trellis and basically just sculpture. Here's before and after, you're looking down the same view. Here you come into the entryway, you see the cantilevered fireplace, you see the high ceiling form, the metal comes inside. Now, I use the metal for a bunch of reasons. I like the basic aesthetic of it in a, in a purely aesthetic sense, and I guess I really like the kinetic sense of metal in my mind. The, the virtue of metal in the desert is that it weathers very well and we have a very harsh climate and exterior exposure. The uh, extensive use of wood you've seen in some of these early remodels or patios is total contrary to my new construction work in the desert. I feel a remodel is a different animal than a new, con new construction from that aspect. And I think that as long as people are willing to accept the weathering and understand it, the trellising and this, the subtle detail of the wood coming out into the, the environment works quite nicely. Uh, I like the metal for its weathering characteristics, and I like the metal for the fact that on a cloudy day in spring when the sun's south in the sky, there's one ambience about your, your structure, your building. On a hot summer day, there's another ambience. As a cloud goes over, there's one. When the sun rises, the building responds one way. When the sun sets, it responds another way. It's constantly changing. 
know, the excitement of architecture is that it's dynamic. It's always changing. If you're successful, you should go to a building as I did uh, one of my mentors and, and close friends is a gentleman named Paul Schweiker, second generation modern master, underrated. Should have become the heir apparent to Frank Lloyd Wright after his death, as opposed to Kahn, but he didn't. And I went to a house that he had done, uh, you know, 30 years after it was finished, and the people were still living there, and they told me that, you know, tell Paul we like this house. It's, it's very nice. We wake up every morning and see something new. You know, that's what architecture should do. You know, it shouldn't be, you know, a temporal thing. I, I have a friend that visited Louis Barragon's office, and I enjoy Barragon's work. I think it's very strong, but it's an interesting point that Barragon, who has a very limited repertoire of work, will only fess up and really be proud to send you to three projects at this point in his life. Okay, three projects because the client are intent enough to repaint those shocking colors every year because they don't hold up in that sun. You know, that to me is too fragile an architecture for reality. You know, I don't think that's the reality we have the obligation to give our clients, you know, and ourselves. Uh, there's something more than that. Could you maybe, you know, kill that? You don't have to see me, you can just see the slides. Uh, the, uh, so, you know, metal and detailing and color, and I don't know how I rambled off there, but let's keep going. Uh, here you have the, the couch playing against the, uh, the block wall and the fireplace there. You have the little curly cord Italian lights and the G40 bulbs. I like G40 bulbs. I like the round spherical simplicity of light stated and the, and the filament glowing. Uh, I like to play around with the light. Like I say, that's a little three inch gutter skylight that you see around that uh, little ceiling. And, that is, uh, in a subtle way, it's not the exact poetry of the Howe House roof by, by Schindler, but it's uh, a little homage to that fact, the way it frames out. Uh, he did a very ingenious thing of stepping down his beam sizes as, as it rotated around up at the Howe House. Program. Client had a dining table that family had grown up around, antique. It became the focus of the, the new plan in this old cat's claw thing, and the family continued to grow up around this table. And it's sort of fun to see your clients' kids grow up and, and, and they grow older and, and the whole happening that, that occurs. The kitchen cabinets and things over at the right, back to the details, the cabinet detailing is a little bladed 45 degree edge. The bull nose on the wood, butcher block top doubles that in scale. And that dark inlay you see at the tip of the 45 is a 16th inch wide, dying into an eighth on the miter into the butcher block top. That's red vermilion wood, very beautiful exotic wood. Again, those subtleties, those things, that's, you know, you play with them. You know, it's a game, you know, you have fun. Okay, backyard before and after. You can see the funny shaped pool. It's there in both of them. You can see my funny trusses. Same view. There, each uh, child, each space, not only the parents in their curved courtyard, but each child got a courtyard out of the deal. So there you can see one with a sliding canvas barn door, and that is adjacent to the bedroom you see at the right got carried away with the vermilion there. We set up this whole graining on the diagonal, which becomes the juxtaposition against the curve. And we inlaid a clear fur floor with half inch wide vermilion strips in the guest bedroom here, as well as the master bedroom you'll see in a minute. Before and after, same room. That's our womb room. Nice, nice interplay between the owners here. Uh, almost equal uh, energy by both husband and wife. The wife laid the ceramic tile floor, she put on the metal roof, she nailed 1,400 strips, very close by count, three-quarter inch wide alternating on the walls of the womb room. The husband did major carpentry, major mechanical tasks, but there was really a nice interface between the two of them, and that's, that's fun to see. Uh, these people had a little bit of building skills. Uh, some of my clients have no building skills. It's, uh, again, concept, desire, anybody that wants to can and that should always be the case with few exceptions. There you can see the entry door into the master bedroom. It's a, a very heavy plank uh, construction clad in stainless steel on a hydraulic hinge. And this pivot's open and you get the view into the, the master bedroom there at the right. The smaller fire, fireplace mimicking the larger one and you come around the corner there by that jam of stainless that you see in the uh, left hand slide and you come into the bathroom suite which is part of this whole master happening. A lot of room for contrast, a lot of room for, for, for experience and happening. Here you come into the shower. It's a nice place where you can crank it up and have the privacy of your own courtyard. The little cylinder at the left is a rotating element with graded shells for shampoo and soap. That's always a functional problem in a bathroom. A little cabin up in uh, Pinewood, Arizona. This was one of my first projects. It was a little thousand square foot cabin up in a very small lot, a 
think the lot, if I remember correctly, was something like 40 or 50 foot wide uh, uh, by 100 foot, something like that, typical Malibu lot, and uh, had some trees on which I wanted to save, and so I rotated the building at an angle to the street, and the two-story elevation is the street side facing north. The core element became the stacked toilet rooms wrapped in core 10. The deck faces south, and while there's no active solar input, it has a nice natural quality with that south-facing deck and the way it reflects in light and, and warmth in, in the winter. Cortan, galvanized metal, a rough sawn plywood. Again, I like plywood as a material, again, not because it's a cheap material. That isn't my rationale. Okay, there's an aesthetic about plywood that I think is important to my architecture, to architecture, to art. It's, that scale is that you get beautiful, technology of our age expressed as planes of wood. It's a process, it has purpose, it has structure, it has all kinds of integrity about it. You know, you put those little score lines like T111 and make it look like four inch boards, that's not plywood. That's, you put that on your house, you might as well clad it in uh, walnut plastic laminate. This is the same truth to it. Uh, you know, so I use it because it's a planar happening. It's one of the hardest materials I have to sell to clients. I can sell them a galvanized metal wall quicker than I can sell them plywood. We have strange mindsets. They come through our society, they come from our background, or, or whatever, but they're there and you deal with them. Okay, this is a, a summer view, and there you see the inside of the cabin. It's 1,000 square feet, sleeps 13 people. The program was four daughters, four friends. There's four bunk beds up in the loft, and an additional five sleeping spaces. It was built for $17,000. I prefab, set up a prefab program with the owner out of his garage through spring proceeded to go up with him on his vacation. He was a lawyer that never built anything before other than a patio I had originally met him with via the first tile commission. They all come back to haunt you or to be your joy. You'd never hide them. Uh, and so we went up together for two and a half weeks and we basically got almost ready for glass and then he proceeded to finish it himself. Express structure, a little uh, walnut and plexiglass dining light, dining table. Uh, my commitment is that on a residence, I don't take the, the hard fascist line that I will do your interiors or else. Uh, there is a little statement that if there's a designer involved in your project, I'm it. You know, it's not uh, Betty the interior decorator or Bob the interior decorator. You know, once you make that commitment, I'm, I'm it. There's greater personal considerations in a house than in a commercial or public building. Uh, commercial or public, I don't sign on the dotted line unless they realize it's graphics, it's landscape, it's interiors, because you know somebody's going to do it. You know, if they have faith in you to do the building, they better damn well have faith for that fairly minor investment of the interiors and the graphics, and they're going to, you know, should reap the benefits of it, hopefully. I hope I understand my buildings better than somebody from the outside, you know, whatever that means. Another view here, a little fireplace we worked up. Ingrained uh, block flooring, we just uh, had a bunch of four by sixes sliced like salami and laid them in, uh, similar to industrial floors that they use in auto plants and things like that. Uh, north facing skylights up in the uh, loft there, the pivoting panels, uh, the main finish is here. I really have a, I don't like drywall particularly, it doesn't really do any sen sensory tactile things for me, it doesn't get me all high. And so here what I did was it became the plywood walls inside and then oil tempered masonite became the lateral walls to give the tonal change and just with Watco oil on you get a, a nice juxtaposition I think of, of texture and form. Uh, as a result of that cabin winning a plywood award and some other things, uh, plywood people were made aware of me and they commissioned me to do a couple little idea cabins. This was one of them. And again, you learn from different things. This was a cabin that was designed to be anywhere USA more or less and with a similar program to what I had done with the, with the uh, Galloway cabin. And in doing the Galloway cabin, I suddenly learned that uh, the kids are going to grow up and that nice loft with a skylight and all that isn't going to be used that much by the kids. So why the hell worry about them? You know, they've got a nice place to, to be when they do come home and whatever. So in this unit, I split it up and did a little master module unto itself and gave them sort of the retreat and the suite that they deserved in a second home situation. And then on the left-hand side, you had a loft for the kids and the main living areas. And then there was a little skylight umbilical or connection between the two. And the one thing that I fortunately, well, one wasn't built, so I don't know if it's fortunate or not, but I speculated on that, it, okay, what happens when somebody in Michigan writes in to buy some plans for this thing if it gets that far? First thing they're going to do is, uh, it's not like Pinewood, Arizona, where there aren't mosquitoes. They're going to put a screen porch on this deal. Where does it go? So consequently, out of that entry juxtaposition, you have that flaring deck, which would have had a detailed screen porch to meet that climatic condition. Uh, this is a little cabin for my patron, the fellow with the little round concrete building. 
This is up in uh, Carmel Valley, in from uh, Carmel, about 14 miles in a very exotic little ranch. There's a 200 foot tall redwood tree uh, right adjacent there on the right hand edge of the left slide. And uh, the owner was into the Japanese at, at uh, the time. And so we, we did a little trip on Japanese, and this becomes a little uh, tribute to Isa. Only my crossing uh, beams become stainless steel gutters, and my shingle roof becomes four foot butts out of the uh, Pacific Northwest in contrast and scale. And you have a nice little you know, juxtaposition. The siding on those two little cantilevered bath and storage units that you see in the right hand slide are actually uh, truck siding, aluminum truck siding, like you have on a Fruhoff truck. You know, juxtaposed. You know, I, I use all those funky materials too, but I hope to do different things than some people do. Okay, this is, became the start of my um, uh, commercial work. The first large project I had on my own. It was a 17-inch thick uh, adobe, burnt adobe walls on the east and west perimeters. And then, because it was on a well-traveled street, I wanted to break up the noise and visual pollution of that street and the U pump at gas station across the street and the. the the Circle K, and so I developed these Corten lattice works to form buffer gardens. You go from a desert transition into a lush transition and into the building. There's a series of boxes on the roof clad in Corten that bring in cool north clear story light. Uh, it's a credit union, and I wanted to sort of play that security idea that I was getting into with the gratings on the front and back of the building with this sliding barn door of Corten grating and the little entry plaza that comes out into the parking lot to break up the scale. Uh, artwork uh, was commissioned by Paulo Solari and a very fine weaver named Carl Samuels. Uh, leather chairs and a furniture system that I got out of Canada and then modified it and did some of my own things with it. Teller's line there. Clear story hopper you can see there with this, the exposed sculptural duct happening, the rust on plywood, the adobe comes inside. Vault articulated out of steel deck uh, metal roof with this uh, gridded troffer lighting, little workroom. A uh, courtyard on the left-hand side there with the lattice work and a place for the, the employees to retreat during the mild times of the year. And the toilet rooms, they all were given a fine art photograph, the, uh, a lot of thought into tile joining and all those sort of, sort of details. Uh, a building for an air conditioning contractor. Somebody asked me, do I draw blueprints to get building permits? And they had a little slump block Spanish building that they wanted to build for an office to tag onto the front of their Butler building. And I explained a little bit what architecture was about and this project generated. Um, it was a budget of $32,000 for a 2,000 square foot building. It was built in the mid 70s. The roof is a conveyor belt cover. Expanded that to a 20 foot span, doubled the skin, did sort of an airplane uh, wing sort of substructure in it. So I got structure, insulation, architecture, finish, weatherproofing, all for a very reasonable dollar. And that really was what was able to bring the, the cost in. This combination of that and the cinder, black cinder sandblasted block, as you come in, again, it becomes a celebration of what these people are about. They're a sheet metal company. They're an air conditioning company. Okay, I celebrate the happening of the metal from the receptionist's desk, which mimics the vaulted form, to the planners you see in the foreground, to the sliding cabinet doors, light fixtures. I wanted to do something. Went back in the shop, worked with a craftsman, and we developed some prototypes, and we built it. You know, it, it happened. That 32,000 included fees and plants and artwork and the whole nine yards. Uh, the chairs, the, the, the great dining table there, GRAT, or conference table. Little $7,000 interior on a uh, long, narrow, 14 foot high, 14 foot wide tunnel space in an old building up in Prescott, Arizona, turned into a gourmet restaurant. Dropped the banners in, which the owner sewed, and we hung and got the nice geometry of shadow. Uh, took the owner's uh, turn of the century photo album, or the folks photo al album, went to the blue printer, had some sepia prints blown up. Suddenly the artwork in this little commercial space became very personal to the owners. Again, architecture, scale, light, color, you know. Remodel of a building for an electric contractor. The graphic of the logo being a major thing that they saw in their, their images in a very visible location here on the street. All projects don't get built. Uh, this was a modular tennis court scheme that somebody came to me with. They, it was a developer type that had this real fine idea of tax breaks and tax scams and all these good things that you could do with perimeter material uh, land at uh, shopping centers, uh, regional shopping centers. And the idea was to drop this little little deal onto this unused land until the, the developer needed to lease it off or sell it off to the next Burger King or or. Um, car wash place and then you could just truck this up to the next new shopping center and set it up and get your tax breaks all over again. And so it became sort of a, uh, a play on tubular metal and trampoline fabric and uh, trellis shade. 
a idea for a landscape nursery. Uh, some pinwheel trusses, uh, truss joists uh, rotating out. The big one, I think, had a 96-foot diameter. The small one was 48-foot. Just became sort of organizing this whole thing into what the logo became Circle Gardens, and the name of the place became Circle Gardens. Because of the uh, economics at the times in the late 70s, we weren't able to, to build it. This was a little site analysis problem more than a real architecture problem. I had 3,500 square foot of site, not building to deal with. I had to handle circulation. I had to handle trailer storage. I had to uh, batch concrete, store all the bulk materials, have a little retail building. And besides all that, those beige legs you see grow up on a giant billboard that the circulation had to go underneath. So it was sort of a fun little problem and it ended up with a little 96 square foot building out of the deal that uh, a little sculpture in wooden block and then a little larger facility for the same company. Th these are Rockies concrete things, got with the concrete building. Uh, public library. I finally put it in my head that, hey, I'm not going to get any public work until I fill out one of those dumb 254 federal forms, because that's the mindset of the bureaucrat, right? And uh, for a long time, I'd just trash them. You know, I'd see these exciting projects, and I really you know, want to do this kind of architecture, and I, I like public architecture very much, and always been intrigued with it, and I wanted to do some. So finally, I filled one of those forms out, went for it, and 36 architects interviewed, and I fortunately came up with a job. It was a 10,000 square foot branch library facility for the city of Phoenix with a $700,000 budget, basically. Never done a library before, and proceeded to do in-depth uh, evaluation. It's a normal process. Again, I think responsibility of the architect should be to, to understand the functional requirements of, of the needs and of the clients. Uh, a lot of my friends wondered how I was going to have to buckle under to the bureaucracy and all these, you know, stodgy bureaucrats up there in City Hall and what I'd have to compromise and sell out to do to, to, to bring this off. You know, there's my plywood, there's my exposed ducts, my galvanized tin and all those good things that sort of have become part of my vocabulary and, and what I enjoy in, in making this building happen. Uh, I proceeded upon getting the commission to go to every branch in the Phoenix system and then go with the library director at the time to the city of Tucson about 150 miles away and look at their whole system. That gave me a, a whole dialogue and list of rights and wrongs. I wasn't there to ask all the right questions, but the wrong questions. Talk to users, talk to librarians, talk to you know, library aides, the whole gamut, and try to put together some logic to what was happening. Based on the budget and location, the construction market at the time, I came up with basically a simple one-room scheme in that you have a 6,000 square foot main reading room, and I'm playing around with a little 45 degree, um, degree geometry spinning off that, which mostly manifests itself in the placement of the interiors. Now, the shopping center it's adjacent to has a lot of 45 degree angles, and your typical bidder contractor understands how to do 45s very easy. That's become almost you know, commonplace for him if you give him, he's done enough in industrial parks that he knows that, you know, all these people sex up their buildings with racing stripes in industrial parks and 45 degree angles now. So he knows how to do those. Uh, so I played off that and just breaking down my masses and then came up with this sort of fun, I think, fun beam structure. There's 71 ton precast beams that were sight cast on the slab and we proceeded to lift those puppies up and uh, span the main reading room and create a sense of place with them. Uh, you have the, the detailing of the 45 carrying throughout and one of the important functional things in the library was that with Proposition 13s and a lot of things like that, there's no city in America that really has the proper funding to maintain a facility anymore. So I think your obligation, not just to the private sector client, but to the, you know, the public client is, you know, how do your buildings weather? How do they age? Do they age with dignity or do they fall apart and look like hell and not be anything that you dreamed about because the paint looks like, you know, crap, the stucco's failing and all these things are coming apart within a couple of years. I think we should have an obligation to design for the long haul. Our cities we owe that to and our clients we owe that to. And if there's any salvation, maybe is that it'll all crack up and blow away all this crap that's going down now within five or ten years. And I say that being a developer or being a just bad modern or bad postmodern because I don't think there's a difference. Um, so this building here had the point of the 45 and the control being that you can see from that checkout desk and circulation, the way I arrange the ranges of stacks, one person can see the entire library. There's no dead spots in that, in that facility. So at lunch break or coffee break or whatever, when there might be one person staffing, you still have the flexibility and the control. That was, a, to me, an important function of this building. There you can see the material palette on the right, the raked metal walls, which cover across the top. And again, it's the idea the building can grow. You can just blow those walls out, and the building can grow like a sausage, both to the east and the west. 
That's where I wanted my sun protection. They're heavily insulated. There's a little three inch gutter skylight separating the heaviness of the concrete beam structure. Four inch sand textured concrete block sandblasted became the main module. Uh, rather than eight inch because the scale of the user, I have a lot of kids here and a lot of small people and I wanted to break the scale of this, this massive building. There you have the building city in the desert landscape. Unfortunate failing of the building is that, you know, out of the magnanimous of your developer mentality client that did the shopping center, he gave this land under duress to the city for a library and then proceeded to isolate us in a no man's land. The perimeter of my site is four inches past the footings all the way around and four inches past the tips of those beams on the north end. So it wasn't a big site problem. You know, this, uh, this is the entryway here, meeting room. Furniture, again, nobody had done an interior for a public building controlled since in the history of Phoenix. I was the first architect that said, hey, who does that? What, you know, why can't I do it? And uh, suddenly I was doing it. So I did a graphics program, an art program, furniture program. The building bid $80,000 under budget. The interiors bid $15,000 under budget. There's finishes like stainless steel and the tile. The building's a year and a half old now, been occupied. And I feel very good. It's frightening. I, I virtually get chills up my spine when I go there, okay? But it's like Christmas every day there. The use of this facility is frightening. I think, my God, they're going to destroy the building, right? It's just unbelievable. I mean, you know, it's like Christmas shopping at a shopping center. But it's weathered pretty well. Uh, little geometry plays, the bipartisan stainless steel doors, another functional thing. You know, all the libraries I went to, typical thing I heard about, it, almost every one, was the doors were a problem. Well, of course the door, doors are a problem because people come in with their arms full of books or they leave with their arms full of books. And consequently, they're racking the hardware. They're, you know, they're ripping the doors apart because, not on purpose, just because that's the nature of being awkward movement of doors. So these are electric eye doors that just operate and close. And now the whole system is going to that detail. And their latest bond issue, they're asking for funds to change out every library to electric eye doors. So I guess it, it made some sense. A uh, little gate here that mimics that acoustic screen you saw in the meeting room that slides open for security or closed at night and you enter into sort of a small scale space that teases you a little bit about the big space. Then you come under the mechanical trough and you're into the big reading room. The little bare theater lights bring down the scale for kids coming into that. down those ranges. You can see a little bit the reflection of the light coming down that gutter skylight against my brake metal wall there. Just seemed like the right thing to do in uh, regard to the roof pitch. Librarian's office, uh, the glass form playing in tension with the masonry ma mass that holds up the big precast beams. Little details, the coral artwork photos in the uh, book circulation area there. And again, the toilet rooms have artwork in them. You go in a toilet stall here and there's a fine art print by Edward Munch in each one. It comes out of a, just a fine art book. It's not original, undoubtedly, but there has been not one attack of uh, malicious graffiti in the toilet rooms at this facility in a year and a half. Stainless steel stalls, sandblasted block, and a, and a photo art. People aren't intentionally evil. Okay, getting back into the residential scale of things, the sheet metal contractor, when he finished his house, he was all or his office was all hot to do a house, so we proceeded to, to take off on that adventure. Had metal as a resource, again, natural given in this case with the business and all that and all the good fun we had had originally, and a brother who was a brick mason. Two major materials. Okay, proceeded to work on a fairly tight site, although nice in its proximity to the mountain preserve area of Phoenix on the uh, far distance there and wanted to maximize this small lot and uh, maximize privacy and interest of the, of the user. And so the, four, the, the cylinders on the left, there's four of them, the smaller ones with the round windows, four children, four bedrooms. The taller service cores that interlock there are service functions of laundry, bathroom, etc. And then the brick just becomes a large solar catch brick funnel with the articulated um, finger joining of the brick rather than sawing. You get the nice shadow play and detail up that, that vertical. Here you can see the floor plan. Just a nice 
simple juxtaposition. The brick funnel has a brick floor. There's a 70 foot wide covered veranda to the south. There you can see as you approach. A lot of times, you know, these slides look pretty primitive right now. The plants haven't grown up. You know, you're obviously hot to get out there and take your pictures so you can start showing it off when it's done. And, you know, they all mellow into the environment very, very easily. Here you have your covered veranda. You can see the solar collectors that form a balcony rail for a roof garden up there on the roof. An Avery on the left, a swimming pool on the right. And this is a summer view, and you can see what kind of penetration of the sun we're getting into our glass. It's uh, relatively non existent. The cylinder there at the entry funnel on the left is a guest closet. You come down two and a half feet into the, I wanted to set the scale of the house down because it's a giant house for this, the, the site. But again, there's program requirements and how do you try to intelligently solve them? You know, here it was tucking down into the grade. The dining room is clad in copper and the cylinder there I've expressed. That's how I formed all those little uh, roofs for the cylinders and made sense out of that. A little pinwheel truss with a, a rolled steel channel uh, or plate skylight compression ring and then a tension ring at the perimeter. They framed up like nothing. There you can see a view across the living room on the right with the wood cylinder being clad in sill blocks. The owner being a contractor type uh, had heard of the Verde Valley that a, a track builder went bust and he had scheduled to do 20 houses or something. It had all these nice clear fur sill blocks cut in a 45 degree chamfer. So we picked them up for a song, proceeded to cut them in half and got sort of that ribbed effect of the wood. The six foot round bay window at night has a very nice view down to the city high rise district. There's the pinwheel truss. At that point, I didn't realize it. I was so happy to see them up there that I went racing in and do they work? So I proceeded to swing off them. And they proceeded to tell me there was only one nail in each joint. <laughs> they didn't go anywhere. They were very stiff. It's a very, uh, very simple element. There you can see in the bedrooms, you've got the built-in furniture to, to optimize the, the geometry of the circle. 12 inch round compression ring becomes a skylight for that bedroom. And then each child has the carpeted walls for tack surface and the round windows with views up into the mountain preserve view out the master bedroom up on the top level, some of the detailing on the bathrooms, copper sinks, stainless steel counters and tubs. You know, play with your media. This is a little round house up in the desert north of Phoenix. Uh, circular geometry. This was a carpenter that worked on the Carver Air Conditioning Building as a moonlighter when we were building that. He liked what I was doing and hired me to do a house. And it has views in 360 degrees. It's a desert site and consequently did deep overhangs with the desire for total views. Focus hub is a little cattle tank here with a skylight above. Another trust period house. House for a sheet metal worker that helped me do the furniture and the light detailing at the Carver office building. And one day I was back there working on a light fixture or something and Dave said, hey, you're going to do a house for us someday. I really like this stuff. This is fun. And I said, sure, that's great. And I figured a few years down the road, well, three weeks later, he had a five acre parcel. <laughs> and we weren't ready to go. And uh, he's a beautiful animal of a person. Uh, I say that in the best sense. You know, he's just a very energetic, vibrant person uh, with very, you know, fine craft abilities and, and uh, you can push him and push him and, uh, you know, you're going to get a product. So the, the compliment here became I knew he was very skilled in metal work and I developed a scheme of a space, um, false space frame really, this truss roof system is 70 foot on a side, it weighs 15,000 pounds, it's made up of numerous components of two and a half inch diameter pipe. That became one con element of the design concept. Uh, Complementing that and tension is three foot thick rubble masonry walls. Now a rubble masonry wall is similar to what Wright used to tell yes and west. It's rock desert gathered from the desert around the roads adjacent to it, etc. and laid in a dry concrete mix and getting a very nice rubble concrete texture. Three foot. You know, what the hell do you need three foot walls for? Well, you need it for the spirit of the idea. Uh, builds you a little thermal mass, but mostly it's an idea and, and, and you know, it's architecture. Uh, the walls proceeded to develop and they developed in two foot lifts, which are express, expressed by the horizontal reveals. Uh, one of my clients, the credit union you saw earlier, shreds for security reasons all their computer runouts, right? So Valerie Platt proceeded for weeks on end to go and get garbage bags full of computer readouts that were shredded. This became a insulating core in this wall. I have another client that sells lettuce boxes, okay, for Weyerhaeuser. They have what are called bad cuts where you can't pack lettuce because the box falls apart. But you can fold them up and get a nice cube that you stuff with computer paper and get a building block that says you don't have to have that extra 100 tons of rock in this wall to finish it. So the cores of these walls are lettuce boxes stuffed with computer paper wrapped with stone. And then the roof that you see on the right was fabricated in two and a half weeks by the husband, the wife, and the father. 
okay, when you design something like that, you get a little bit gun shy, right? Um, you know, what are the tolerances of that many pieces going together, and where is the system going to fail? And you design a sixteenth in, an eighth in. What do you design for tolerance? You know, how big do you make your bolt holes? How does it all go together? Okay, the last piece of pipe with the two flanges was lifted into place by Dave, and his wife proceeded to slip the two bolts into the holes. Okay, no double jack, no jacking it around, slipped in with no effort, and bolted together. The man is an artist, a craftsman. We proceeded then uh, to call a crane company, and we got this silly little crane out there that was a 40-ton crane, and oh, sure, we can do it. They came out and looked at the deal, and it was a dirty, ugly crane, and it was a dirty, ugly day. And it huffed and it puffed, and it almost tipped over. So the next day, we got another crane company out, and it was a sunny day, and we had a big 80-ton Marco crane, and we set the roof in 10 minutes, and it was sort of a fun experience. You can see the way the house is developing and the importance of that roof. The, there's a clear story all around the upper area there, which is solar grade thermopane. And that little slot, you see the two by four nailing member that receives the two by decking up there on the roof. You see the little slot between it and the two and a half diameter pipe dimension. That's glazed with an inch and a half slot of plexiglass. It was glazed on the ground before we left it to truss. Uh, we put all those two by four nailers on on the ground because it made more sense. When it went up with those, you were ready to deck it. It wasn't straddling out there and figuring out scaffolding, what do you do and, you know, wasting time and energy. Proceeded to get the roof on, you can see the tension of the contrast of our stone walls and, uh, you know, taliesin's nice, but these are probably the, the cream of rubble masonry walls that might ever have been done. They're very meticulous and they're, uh, you know, a tribute to Dave and his energy and his efforts for a year of weekends. Uh, very fine metal reveal detail was worked out that let the forms climb and became the expression. That front door there, again, you get to do, you know, the there's, there's the joys and the agonies, the agonies of time and the agonies and the joys of going up and down with an owner builder through all their highs and lows that you know are going to be there even though you tell them they don't believe you. Uh, but you have the, the reward, you know, you get to do the kind of things here. We've got about $55,000 in this house, okay? It's been appraised at 187, unfinished. Um, you get things to happen like that front door, which is a series of glue laminated beams clad in copper and those half inch slots are glass. They're glazed, set the two brass rails on either side. We figured out Dave's labor on that. If I was to specify that door in another one of my projects, I'd have him make that. Material cost is about 600, 700 bucks. Street value and labor puts that at about four and a half grand. Little earth integrated passive solar house on a highly traveled street, uh, south orientation, earth berm, buffering you against the noise there on the right. Um, Owner builder that's gone on the slow agony that I spoke about. It's got, let's see, a 78 job number on it, designed in 78, and it's just nearing completion now. Uh, there you can see the house as it sits. Uh, we've been through three, four summers in the house, four full air conditioning cycles. There is no air conditioning, there's evaporative cooling, there's no heating by conventional standards, and the house isn't even tuned yet. Uh, biggest electric bill is 40 bucks a month. Okay. Uh, I'm not a solar purist. Solar purists, you know, probably, you know, you know, just don't respond to my work, maybe at all. You know, I'm not after that ultimate BTU or whatever the hell the figure is they use, okay? Uh, I think it's important to be conscious of solar, make it a part of your architecture intelligently, make it respond to it, just like it is to have a good toilet that flushes well and saves water, to have the right colors that you choose, to have the right door hardware. It's just another component. It's not architecture's reason to exist, to be perfection of solar. This was a little, one of the early projects that should have been in that moonlight phase. I uh, was chatting with a guy that officed back in the draft room when I worked for the last firm I was with, and all of a sudden he wanted to uh, put a door through to his backyard to the swimming pool they had just put in. And we got to chatting, it was a little zero lot line zoning deal, a very tiny house, but you had to come through the, the house through the sliding doors, which are just to the left here of the slide, and so he wanted to wade back to the pool. And we got to talking and chatting, and he really wanted a dark room too, and it would be nice to have a little bigger bedroom. So we did this little snail form that came out, became a little setting, sitting extension to the bedroom, a little step glass facade to break up that early sunrise view into the bed. And the core element of the shingles there became a dark room adjacent to the plumbing and close to the plumbing of the master bathroom. Thousand dollar addition, took four weekends to build. Went out and pounded nails with them. There you can see expression of structure and, uh, you know, Maybe I, you know, I think I have a philosophy about my work. I hope a philosophy shows through my work. I think that's very important. But um, while there's things that you see repeated maybe and whatever, the work is all different because of response to site and client and situation. 
Uh, it's sort of interesting, I think, parallel. I knew Bruce Goff personally. He was a beautiful, beautiful person. And a lot of people look at Bruce Goff's work and they say, my God, look at this ego. You know, here's the ultimate decadence of a modern architect, right? And what they were laying, this heavy ego trip on all their clients and all this weird fantasy crap. And the reality is that every Bruce Goff house that was done was not for Bruce Goff, was not for him. It was for those people that lived there. Whether it was the little lady that had an antique bottle collection that he did the, the pyramid-shaped glass shelf and glass pyramid windows in Bartlesville, or whether it was work for the people that we drove down the street to see in Bartlesville, and I got this address, and I looked, and I looked at this house, and here's cream brick, and it's uh, metal, and I think, God, Gunnar Burkitts didn't do a house here. Richard Nitro didn't do a house here. What's, what's this deal, you know? Well, I figured it looked like it was pretty well done, so we proceeded to ring the doorbell, right? This little lady greets us at the door, you know? Yeah, this is a golf house. Wanna, you don't want to come in? Okay, sure. You know, take your shoes off, okay? <laughs> So we proceeded to take our shoes off and she proceeded to run a broom and a mop behind us as we walked through her house. She had very thick glasses, they were nearly blind, the house was flooded with beautiful light, the focus was two grand pianos, and that was her house that Bruce Goff had done. I think the thing that I've learned most from Bruce Goff is sensitivity to client. He did it better than Wright, he did it better than you know, probably many, many, almost 95% of the modern architects that practice. I think people, when you look at Bruce Goff's work, think about that. It's the clients and think about the needs that were met and how they generated into the fantastic solutions that that mind generated. Whether it be the little domed house for the couple that came to him when they started university life at OU and said, hey, we figured out what it's going to cost us to rent an apartment for our stay at the university. We got $4,000 or something. Can you, that's your budget to do a house for us. We want to live in a piece of art. And he proceeded to respond to that and build a very beautiful little house for these people or the people that were farmers that saw an article about him when he was practicing in Kansas City. They called him up and they said, we want a house, and we're just little farmers, and we don't have any money to speak of. And I think that was in the 60s, and he had maybe $15,000. And he proceeded to build a house, and it was designed around a screen porch with a porch swing. Because these farmers, when they got out of the field, they liked to swing in their swing. You know, I mean, that's being an architect, you know. It's, uh, you know, so I, I, I don't buy this thing that modern architecture is bad, that modern architecture is evil, that, uh, uh, Postmodern is the answer, you know. Uh, you know, architecture is timeless. It's not isms and uh, periods and names that are made up by critics and media and hype and PA and whatever the hell. You know, it's not something to sell magazines. You know, it's something to meet a need of society, of our culture, of our cities. You know, that's what we're about, hopefully. You know, and you know, sure, ego shows through. Sure, there are a lot of things to show through. But if it's going to be successful. You know, think of that user. You know, really get into that user. You know, be, by being responsive and sensitive to him, you know, he's your ticket to any fantasy you ever dreamed of. Anything that you can pull off, he's going to be game for if you do your homework and respond to him. You know. So this client has again become friend, and I ran up and remodeled a 1903 house in Denver, and they didn't like their job and the climate, and they came back to Phoenix, and we picked up the lot at the the right there. And I don't want to be preachy. I hate uh, I'm sounding too preachy. I don't mean to, but uh, you know, here in the heart of Venice City and the, the heart of the of where it's at, I, I, I somewhat get frustrated sometimes because I don't see L.A. being that beautiful city of, of dreams and, and all the magic uh, when I drive up and down. And it's frustrating, you know. I, you know, I, I like architecture and I like beauty, and I, you know, when I go tooling around tomorrow with my clients and friends that have, have brought me here and my wife, I'm, uh, you know, going to go back and look at some of the oldies and goodies, you know, and uh, you know check out uh, Arroyo Drive in Pasadena again because it's an interesting experience and uh, check out the Sturgis house because it's fun and you know go to King's Road and uh, you know that's pretty frustrating to think that here's a city of 14 million people and I can show somebody that doesn't know much about architecture what I consider to be probably 75 percent of the great architecture of this city in one day that's you know what does that say about architecture and culture uh, more preaching uh, site on the right is on a cul-de-sac uh, you have a cul-de-sac and it has a center point for its curve and I knew from that first little project you saw that I have a client that trusts me and I can have fun with and they like curves and then they want an adobe house they're from New Mexico and so we went tooling over to Santa Fe and Taos and rode the back roads and saw all these beautiful adobe buildings and I was you know sort of uh, impressed and just freaked out by all these sinuous uh, soft mud adobe walls and gated courtyards that I'm sure someday I'll get tr in trouble in for trouble about because I'll open one of them because I'm always intrigued what's inside those courtyards but there's all kinds of beautiful gates all over New Mexico that are really nice 
and roof scuppers. Okay, roof scuppers are a big thing because you gotta get that water off the roof and away from the adobe or it's just gonna melt and go away. So uh, sensuous curves became uh, an idea and I set up the whole geometry of the house from the center point of the cul-de-sac. We had a zero lot line, or not zero lot line, but a, a very reasonable uh, setback variance that we could put a six foot wall up right at, almost to the street, which is very nice. So you get this true southwestern courtyard house. Uh, the main focal points, we put a nail in that center and we drew off and all those forming boards you see as the exposed floor are all radial back to that nail in the center of the street. And that was very easy to plumb up to the exposed framing that you'll see in a minute. Uh, house is sunk down two foot eight into the ground because we hope to make all our own adobe. We were gaining the solar advantage of being down in the site as well as getting all the dirt for our adobe. Well, the husband that was going to take off to do this uh, suddenly got hired by the governor and he couldn't refuse, couldn't say no. He made a deal he couldn't, couldn't refuse as hard as he tried. And the wife sort of took over his main ramrod. And there you can see our walls going up. And it's funny, again, you've got to understand and respect craftsmen. I think that's an important uh, thing. You know, you, you go out and a lot of uh, contractor types and uh, builder types and craftsmen, be it a mason or a metal work electrician, you know, they think the architect's a real asshole. And 95% of the time they're right and you gotta live that down. <laughs> uh, you know, but you've got to relate to what they have to say and if you draw it, you know, damn well know how you can put it together. Either reason with the guy and understanding his craft well enough to know it can be done and don't get that egg on your face and you know, if he can't do it, pick up your tools and do it. Uh, and in this house, it's sort of interesting with our craftsman mix here. Okay, the blonde lady is uh, Pat, the owner. Uh, the uh, guy in the yellow shorts is Ken Hochstetter, just a uh, beautiful human being, the finest mason you could ever expect, laying our curved adobe wall. Never laid adobe in his life before, but he was a hell of a brick mason and really thought this adobe was fun stuff. The guy up on the roof was a fellow that was an architecture student that uh, wasn't an architecture student. He applied to the architecture program. He had worked in some offices with me, and he put together a portfolio based on you know, uh, his experience in some offices and seeing where it was at and the school flunked him on his portfolio. That was a requirement to get in. They said nobody could do a portfolio this good. And three or four of us that knew him proceeded to write letters and they gave him an A++ on his portfolio. But unfortunately his grade point put him, you know, one person shy of getting into the program and he proceeded to do sort of a maverick thing. And He's now built a very interesting uh, underground house and again he's a, a very skilled carpenter and uh, he and I did all the framing along with the owners on this, ha this house because I I figured that's the way it was really going to get done. Um, but the, the funny thing is the craftsmanship, when people come, the main double width walls that we have there that are articulated with the, the fingering joints again, we have 17 inch thick walls and did some lateral things because theoretically a two-story adobe is illegal, a mud mortar adobe is illegal, but I got a pretty good rapport with the, the, the county people and, the, and the things like this happen. Um, and anyways, the main portion of the house was laid up by some real adobe masons, you know, Mexican type, right? And the walls go every which way and up and down. And then Ken, our meticulous, uh, you know, Scandinavian mason comes and lays these beautiful curves across the front, right? And people that come to the house can, can pick up on, on that feeling. And uh, a lot of the people, friends of the family that have come from New Mexico and their background, they said, geez, why didn't you have the adobe guys do the whole house? You know, this is, you know, so it's just where you're at. I mean, I had no problem with the, the juxtaposition and uh, it's a subtlety, but it's an interesting response to materials, you know, by, by different craftsmen and their approach. Oh, the, uh, that skylight wasn't on the original drawing. Again, architecture should be dynamic. It shouldn't be locked into a drawing necessarily. Uh, you know I like to play with edge skylights and I like to manipulate light and all that and that, one of my big reawakenings reawake there was just seeing a double T concrete roof framed over a building once that had an inch and a half gap when I was there on my lunch hour because that's the only time I could go to the job. And the sun's vertical in the sky and here's this beautiful wash of light down this wall. And ever since then, I just, whenever I can, I'll, I'll crack that wall open. And, uh, you know, again, energy-wise, I mean, that's the dumbest damn thing anybody could ever do is put a 14-inch wide skylight, 60-foot wide in the roof of a solar adobe house. I mean, that's just not real good smarts, but yet the house is alive because of it. There's the mailbox, nightlight, address, the walled courtyard as it looks now. The idea of gate as you come to it, the sculptural gate statement, and the roof scupper becomes this concrete, this uh, steel pipe that forms an archway which takes the main drainage off the roof out to the drainage of the street and the cul-de-sac beyond. And you enter under that archway. Corgate metal tower in the background. Again, you drive through New Mexico and it's a nice play of mud adobe and tin roofs because there was common sense in it when those things were built back at the turn of the century. A view of the sunken courtyard, solar greenhouse to the left. There's no conventional heating in the house. 
uh, three zone evaporative cooling system. The entryway, that skylight working. I like the slide on the right a lot that uh, if somebody said, uh, show me one picture of what you are as an architect and what your work's about, I, I give them that slide at this point. View as you step down into the, the living room. Oak steps, and again, the, the tension, the, 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 the contrast. You have the polished concrete floor with the radial one by redwood headers. You have the rough mud, mud adobe walls. You have two and better fur two by 12s on the roof and CDX plywood. Uh, the CDX plywood works, in my mind, there because it's contrasted with fine oak cabinet work and furniture and stainless steel and other metal details. You know, it's a tension, it's a, uh, a contrast. The curving box beam, the kitchen on the right-hand side that plays against. Program requirement, we like to collect ceramics and it's part of our life and it's part of our eating pattern. And so the open shelving against the adobe wall becomes a nice way to display that art. A view down the back side into the master suite. Up in the loft, you have a uh, husband and wife den separated by a carpet clad dark room. That's the client with the dark room, you remember. And you enter under that planner and nightlight over the entryway into a 30 foot long by, in some places, only eight and a half foot wide master bedroom. Some of the details, the, the bathroom, we've got some little concrete sewer pipe windows opening out a grade. A uh, view from that loft looking at her sewing area and den. And a view into the master bedroom. Those metal cylinders are rotating clothes closets for underwear and sweaters and socks, and they roll on the Lazy Susans, and each has two, and they just rotate out and form a buffer for some night lighting. And if you sleep on one side of the bed, you've got a ceiling at 7.4. You sleep on the other side, you've got a ceiling at 15.4. The little couch staircase out to the, uh, the rear patio area to the future hot tub. And uh, people have different dreams. Uh, here's a $800,000 do-it-yourself house. Poured concrete on a mountaintop with an owner that had a program that said, I've got five sons, I have four cars, and I have friends that visit. I would like to be able to cope with 14 cars on my mountaintop. Okay. <laughs> it became a generator of the idea, you know, of the form. You either develop a great parking lot on this mountaintop in the city, or you make something of it. So consequently, part of the program was concrete. He wanted a concrete house. He had a very beautiful, spectacular house, and he had this car problem. And so the car problem was solved by a lower driveway ramp into four garages clad with copper doors and parking for four cars on a lower driveway. A cantilevered ramp that forms a covered pool and terrace area. The husband is fair-skinned with red hair. The wife uh, doesn't bother to be out in the sun, so they each have a place to sit out there on the patio now underneath the driveway or out beyond it and you drive the cars up that ramp and come across the roof and park four more cars on the roof of the garage and then a few more on the driveway and then you're off the mountain. The center point of that geometry became a focal point which will become a fountain now and the house radiates around and flows around and, and steps down into the slope. I was very, you know, trying to be really sensitive to the, the mountain environment and you can see the way the, hopefully the angular forms of the house play against the, the rock pattern that you see there and the patina of that copper roof plays against the desert varnish that you see on the rocks at the right in the foreground. Sort of an interesting thing you don't see in these slides, but Frank Lloyd Wright's last house likes residence is on the site adjacent to this. It's a, you know, it's uh, that last sketch that was done in the last breath by Wright. You know, one more, Frank. And uh, it was executed by the fellowship uh, in the uh, late 60s in peach colored block, called Ruvana's favorite color. And it stands out fairly well, but it is very nicely sited. And as a homage to the right, my circular stone forms, which are made up of stone that we've quarried from our site as we excavate it, just spin around into the adjacent site and play off the right house. And I felt I, I did owe him that, because I, I do respect his work very much and have been to see much of it. I think there's a lot to learn in right. It's, it's interesting when we, we look at things, too, and you know what's vogue and what's current. And uh, you know there, there, there seems to be a constant mysticism with right. And yet, I, I can remember. Well, it still happens, you know, at many schools, but, you know, uh, when I took art history classes, you know, Wright was sort of uh, thrown into sort of freak show time, you know, it was, uh, you know, the serious architecture you looked at was by Corbusier and Gropius and all this good stuff. And, uh, you know, towards the end of the semester, maybe you'd see two, uh, two hours, if you were lucky, of slides of Frank Lloyd Wright, and maybe if uh, your professor knew of Goff, you'd see a Goff or something, you'd, you know, this stuff was wasn't definable. You know, it gives an art historian a frustration, right? Because you, you know, how do you define a Bruce Gaw? You know, what chapter of the book do they fit in? You know, what kind of word do you make up because there's nobody else to be in that chapter except Bruce Gaw? Uh, you know, I think art historians quite often have a need to 
you know, to be comfortable, they, they have to categorize and make periods and, 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 and put this all together. And undoubtedly, there's that context happening, and I don't deny it. But, you know, unfortunately, a lot of good things are, are lost, I think, to, to our perception, be it indigenous architecture or be it architecture by, you know, some of these maybe off-the-wall people. Uh, you know, be it Bruce Goff. You know, I think right now it seems like Bruce Goff is going to get greater fame in his death than he got in his life, in this country anyway. Always respected in Europe and Japan. But look at how many articles you've read about Goff since he died. Think about how many articles you read about Goff in the 10 years before he died. You know, that's sort of strange. There's the right house. I do have a picture of it. And it's, it's blended in. The, the paint's faded just like that Berrigan paint. You know, it's pretty hard to keep paint up and uh, put it in that sun and let it hold up. So it's gotten mellowed out. It is sited very nicely. There you can see the juxtaposition of the uh, aggregate concrete and the heavy concrete beams. The, the curving form there under the low beam is a patio. There's the plan based on the garages and the, the ramp geometry. And you can see how it all rotates off that uh, center point. And these are views of a couple of the spaces inside, the living room on the left and the family room den on the right. Very nice fine finishes eventually where we have the copper roof. So the main structure you see is in place. The finishes inside will be resawn elm ceilings. The owner's uh, uncle is a farmer in Iowa and uh, Dutch elm disease has taken its toll and we proceeded to mill one by eight resawn elm for all the ceilings. And all the vertical walls will be one by three S4S or smooth oil elm. All the cabinets will be black uh, walnut. All the fireplaces will be brass and a very beautiful uh, blood red uh, semi-sweet chocolate colored uh, flagstone from up near the Grand Canyon for the main flooring. And it's a pretty ambitious problem there for somebody that wants to build their own house. And again, we've had skilled people and very good people. That's our happy owner there on the, on the right. <laughs> that was our big four. That was a magnificent day. Uh, my, my early client there, it was funny how small the world is because uh, you know, Rocky Rothermel and Janet, uh, he had me up to the site one time and he said, this would be a great site to build a house on. Well, someday, someday. And I said, Rocky, it's going to cost you a quarter million dollars just to get out on this hill, much more or less to, to build a house on it. And that's about what we've got in this whole ramp affair and what, what, what went down here. But it was a fun problem. You know, you can see it. So it was exciting that day. We pumped it. There you can see it. Uh, trailers, big problem I think for society is uh, you know th those ugly trailers that you see in airplanes when you fly into LA or on the freeway or in Phoenix and uh, it seems like if you go out of Phoenix to the east side now you drive through 40 miles of the goddamn things and yet what option do those people have? You know, there's a certain point in our society where they maybe have 15 or 20 or 30 thousand dollars and some of those things that could cost as much as 70 and 80 thousand dollars I understand. So what do you do with a trailer? Here I, I had an idea of putting together a pair of your typical double wide here, put together the double wide only at a hinge point and developed a triangular solar courtyard in the crotch of that, that juncture. First thing it seems that anybody does when they buy a double wide trailer is throw up a couple tin porches on either side of it, either to park their car under or to have their picnic under. So I put that in between the two double wides here. And it would be in an ideally planned situation, south orientation. You've got the main living functions on the left hand side and sleeping functions on the right hand side. A multiple use housing, another interesting problem. I had a client come to me, and several clients that wanted to do a cooperative housing scheme. And it was four families, uh, university types, Mexican American community, and uh, some other people. Very interesting concept. They bought five acres up near the mountain preserve. They wanted to rezone, get a PAD on it where they could get contiguous uh, property uh, dwelling units, eliminate all normal, you know, do a planned area development, really. So we came up with a scheme that we do nine modules on this property and do sort of a transition garden in between and then leave the majority or about four, three and a half of the five acres in virgin desert, uh, maybe three acres out of the five. Proceeded to develop this idea of working on a module that was 24 foot high, two and a half stories tall and 96 foot long with each person getting a courtyard to the north and a courtyard to the south in those curving forms. Did the sawtooth clear story elements facing south the idea was that some of the owners wanted turnkey, some of them wanted to have do-it-your-self input, and consequently some floor plans that you'll see over in the exhibit are very tight gridded rectangular schemes and others are very angular, based again on the budgets of each client. And the idea was that you could, you could approach custom houses for the, for the common folk by using the repeat of a module here. So that as I went into each one of those courtyards and modules, I would have been giving them unique facades, unique details, unique palette of materials, and unique floor plans designed and tailored to their families. 
Um, there was the common greenhouse and commons building. And the units, we had a contractor involved. They were going to be $65,000 a unit in 1979. They were going to take one ton of air conditioning for a 2,000 square foot plus house, which I felt was a fairly decent accomplishment. And unfortunately, the main promoter in the scheme, uh, not promoter, that's the wrong word, that's an evil word like developer. And the, uh, the main force in the scheme went on sabbatical to, uh, to, to Spain and the group sort of fell apart. And the obituary on the top of this reads much as uh, Wright's scheme for the uh, auto workers that he did in 1948. I don't know if you've ever seen, a, I think it's a 48 or 51 form. You look on the top and there's some really nice multiple housing scheme there and it says, cooperative housing for auto workers. Abandoned for lack of cooperation. <laughs> okay, those, there's a section through showing some of the manipulation of space and uh, a little more detail is thought to it. The whole idea would have been all the roofs were repeat modules and they would have been uh, roofed, glazed, insulated, ceiling finished, and ever, everything in those modules, either trucked to the site or done in the parking lot, and then a crane would have set it, much as I set that big steel trust house. Little house in a, a sand dune over near Yuma for a retired couple in their 70s. Uh, mud adobe brick, rammed earth uh, brick. Uh, wanted a nice solar house, and the problem is the river was to the north of the site. They were on the south bank, and they wanted to look across the river to the views. And so I developed this idea of sort of a Star Wars, uh, be it North African sunken courtyard in the center where you have that pinwheel truss, and you enter into that courtyard, it becomes a solar trap, and then the house flares out to the north exposure and the views they, they desired from the sand dune. There you can see the, again, the happy owners over there, and they're building that house, and their goal is to be in, in it on their 50th anniversary in two years. And this was uh, two years from now, the project started five years ago. This is a house responding to the, really, to Santa Fe, and uh, in Phoenix, it, it's uh, maybe fortunate and unfortunate, you know, as I see, you know, my city or our city grow, it's, it's, it's fairly frustrating because the development mentality is everywhere. It's uh, build them quick, quick, cheap, and dirty and uh, get them leased and sell them and do the next one and uh, take all that fudge money that you saved between the owner and the uh, contractor that the bank gave you and go to Tahiti or something. And, you know, we're building a very poor urban environment, which is very troubling. Uh, but anyways, this house is developed in outside Santa Fe and I don't feel much historic respect for Phoenix. I think there's some farm buildings that happen there and uh, I freaked out a bunch of architects. I, I don't belong to the IA because I have uh, philosophic differences or problems. I think the IA is responsible for turning architecture into a business rather than uh, its position that it had in society as, of respect and art as, as other artists and people of our culture. At the turn of the century they came along with all these fancy business values and suddenly we're no different than a used car salesman or a, uh, you know, a lawyer maybe, or whatever, just hawking our wares out on the street corner. And so I don't belong to the IA, and I was speaking to him, uh, guest speaker, a couple of years ago in Phoenix at their central meeting or whatever, and I didn't mean to offend anybody, and I was just commenting on my materials and what, what I like and don't like, and I made the comment that in Tempe, Arizona, I think the best architecture in Tempe, Arizona are two galvanized metal grain elevators in that town. And here's a full university with all its buildings, the Gamage Theater by Wright, uh, an inverted pyramid uh, town hall, all of Saarinen, uh, and all of a sudden I heard this hush come over the audience, and you know, what did I say? And I didn't mean it that way because I, you know, I don't, you know, I like to approach things positively, not negatively. Okay, getting back to where that was all going, this is in Santa Fe, and I felt very strongly impressed by the, the, the forms and the geometry of Taos, and again, these mud forms and just the beauty of them, and I hope that the plan forms here, you look at the Taos Pueblo in section and a lot of other things, and we can do all kinds of trick intellectualizations, because I can intellectualize with the best of them, even though I don't think it means anything. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, I, I hope I'm responding to that. The main walls are adobe. I've seen a lot of failed galvanized roofs because they've been on the buildings a lot longer in New Mexico than here, and the owner and I made a conscious decision because Core 10 would cost $8,000, and Black Iron would cost $2,000, and by the time that black iron fails in a dry, arid climate like Santa Fe, he and I are going to be both long gone and not going to worry about it. So we're going to just clad this whole form in black iron and let it rust. So it'll be mud adobe left to melt, black iron, and it won't be stabilized adobe, it'll be black iron left to rust, and then the back curve there, which is the same radius as the courtyard curves in adobe, because I've built into the slope, will be poured concrete. Again, the function of the material and the poetry intention of that against the adobe. The south facade, which looks across that courtyard, is solar, and a very nice requirement of this little development called El Dorado at Santa Fe, eight miles east of the city, is that a house must be at least 50% solar efficient. The best we can tell, and that's fairly severe climate, 
it gets you know real cold in Santa Fe, this house will be somewhere around 90% solar self-sufficient. There you can see a couple more shots of the model, and you can see the way it's set into the little rolling grassland site there at the right. Scheme for a glazing contractor's house on the top of a mesa. I like curves. I guess if I had my druthers, I think curves are the best geometry. They're soft to people and friendly, and they really work well. A little house here uh, for a little engineering. Here I had a do-it-yourself client come to me and said, hey, uh, you know, I like your work and I want you to do my house, but um, I'm a draftsman and a mechanical, uh, do electrical and plumbing and things like that. I want to do my own working drawings. Whoa, you know, and they said, we don't want that to nix the deal and if you can't cope with me. Well, turns out he became as good as any draftsman I've ever had and I proceeded to supervise him doing the working drawings for my design and the house that you see evolving is, is there. Uh, Little Mario Botta play there again, sort of pre botta with his big splash, anyways, the, the striped buildings and things. A uh, little more subtle, maybe. I'm playing around with the aggregates a lot lately. I'm doing a whole series of striped buildings, as you'll see a couple variations on. And what I'm doing is taking different aggregates of concrete block, be it sand or cinder, and various color cinders, and very carefully integrating them and then sandblasting and getting this simple patina rather than introducing pigment in the block. It's the actual stuff the block is made of. And here you have, the, again, the interlocking of the south form and the north form and the juxtaposition of scale of the, the masonry unit and the eight-inch line carrying across the lintel across the copper eyebrows. And this house has been through uh, two winters with no heat at all. And they took their child to grandma's house one night because it got a little bit chilly. But other than that, that was it. And it wasn't insulated, it wasn't caulked. So again, when it gets tuned, I think it'll perform quite nicely. A uh, little low-cost tilt-up concrete housing scheme here, a little duplex house, precast concrete walls tilt up. Uh, wanted to get the softened forms of the desert and uh, it's a cored concrete wall similar to some European techniques and uh, what I've done is cast eight inches of concrete for thermal mass on the ground over a rough sawn board texture like you see on the right that's the inside for the surface put down eight inches of concrete put two and a half inches of urethane in it for thermal break and insulation and put a four inch cavity on the outside and wash the aggregate then those hopper forms are all clad and coppered house for a retired couple. I had somebody come to me in a, a strange way, and your clients always seem to come in strange ways. But a retired couple, they wanted a little retirement home up in Prescott, and it's a higher desert, and I feel the wood responds much better to this pinion pine and uh, the vegetation re regime there. So very low budget, they had no money to speak of, and this was built cheaper than a tract house at the time, $39 a square foot. And. Uh, keep getting these nice little postcards and Christmas cards how well the house works solar-wise. The only thing it does really solar-wise is the only windows are on the south and there's no windows on the north. And yet they, you know, have, they rarely turn their heat on. And again, Prescott's a mountainous, a, a cold climate, if you will. Here's the entryway. You've got the, uh, the glass glazed entry coming in. You've got a, a couple here up in their 70s. They're not going to go out and buy all those nice uh, new furniture that you want them to. And yet they had a very nice antique collection. The, the house has been designed as a backdrop there. By using the plywood and the budget, I had the ability to bring that material. Wherever there's an exterior wall in wood, it comes in as wood. So be it plywood or wood boards, you have that, that skin, that nature of the house coming in, you know, a little right in tidbit there. Uh, you've got a bunch of drywall. You haven't seen that much in any of the work. But again, do I tell these people to breeze off because I'm above, you know, that's just I can't cope with it. Or you've got one of the little skylights along the staircase down to the lower level. The fur wall there, one by fur on that little wall that pulls out in articulation. And there you can see what light can do for you. Same stair, one time a day and the other time. That's you know, two inches, two and a half inches of skylight there. You know, look at the thing that happens. There's the better places. View of great transparency about the house. It appears there's one large volume with the glazing separating the elements you can see from the front to the back and this is step down scheme built into the slope. Uh, Porcelain sockets on the ceiling, these little split tube uh, galvanized light fixtures cost four bucks a piece and you know, set a certain quality of detail about, you know, a piece of fresco light. And small projects still are something that I tinker with. That's a playhouse, that's the latest Galloway project, which was that cabin you saw earlier in the scheme of playhouse for his kids a couple years ago. Playing around with a little geometry and a little uh, eight foot square playhouse and a little six foot square booth for the boys choir over there, Phoenix boys choir. Uh, stainless steel drapes uh, hanging in a little oak modular form that they can break down and the, the whole program there was that you had to be able to put it in the back of a typical nine passenger station wagon when it broke down and take it from event to event where they sold tickets. Can I have the next slide for them please? 
a couple more slides. And, uh, uh, recent project, this is my largest public project to date. It's a uh, gymnasium and theater complex for the Phoenix State School for the Deaf. Uh, it's my first project with the state, and I had a very unique client in that it was a school for deaf students. Very sensitive client. Uh, I uh, tried to learn about them and get into what that was all about and in that process while I was going around the campus uh, one thing that uh, became apparent that you can, you can see sort of the way this what appears to be silver and new wraps around this existing gray building up in the upper uh, corner of the L more or less that was an existing locker building that an architect had done several years ago for the school and I went in this building with the director that day when I was first getting my campus tour and the light switches weren't in the right place and both he and I fumbled, stumbling, you know, in, in desperation, looking for light switches to turn on in the space to, to find out where we were, right? Finally, we accomplished that, and uh, I, I also thought, you know, here I am with basically all my senses, you know, and I'm, I'm not frightened, I'm not scared, but I'm very uncomfortable. You know, what must it feel like for the user of this facility, you know, here in darkness? So at that point, I made a major design decision that light was going to be the element, and I know they were sensitive to light anyways in, in their vision, that I was going to try and celebrate in this, that in this building. And beyond just skylights and clear stories and that sort of happening in all the spaces, uh, the, the sort of greatest manifestation, I guess, becomes my fabric roof, which is the first Teflon-coated fabric roof in the Southwest. And it's a 9,000 square foot gym, and I worked with David Geiger of Geiger Burger, the, uh, the experts in that, and uh, that's developed over the gymnasium, which is a, a huge fabric roof form, and uh, I like to play, right? I uh, just like to <laughs> experiment and see what can happen. At night, it just really is a beautiful form. Unfortunately, I don't have any slides for that. that so I've got that form. I've got a very tight budget. The budget was originally funded for a 15,000 square foot facility without a theater with a stage at the end of a gymnasium, which is useless for normal people. For the deaf, it would have been you know, a total violation and waste. Uh, through the use of precast concrete and hopefully some plan logic and detail logic, I was able to get 23,000 square feet, a full 336 seat theater, fabric roof gymnasium, which I paid through the nose for, and a few other things for the original budget. You know, just, you know, what do you do as an architect in trying to understand need and function? And where does the building go from those two criteria? You know, it's not, you know, some fantasy idea of ornament or decoration or wallpaper that goes on the outside of these things. It's got to be a lot deeper than that. Uh, part of the functional things here was that, you know, the way the site developed, I, I really had to put this building back in the back corner by the bus yard that you can see over there, the whole campus. Because the original architect had the idea that you'd build this building in the middle of the athletic field, move the athletic field to the south of the campus, cut the campus in half, and run your football field east-west, which would be great for you know, whoever had the sun in their eyes. Um, so I had to put it in this back you know, armpit, more or less, of the, of the campus, and consequently I, I had to get you there because it's a very important building to the campus. So I, I took this big curved metal form and sort of hid the other guy's building. That's why I really did it. But I took this big curved metal form to sort of draw you into the main entry and the main lobby experience of the building. And in doing, I also gained a large outdoor storage area for field and track equipment, which they never had, which is laid all over. So it had a double-edged double, double edged, edged function. And I like curves, and I like metal, and I like concrete, so the building happened. And this is the rendering, left and building right. And the detail becomes sort of a celebration of circles and curves. I tried to uh, break down the big precast panels by setting in this reveal system at four foot centers to break scale and played all the metal detailing off that module. The lobby with the skylights coming in, the trees aren't in place yet on the right hand slide, but that's our lobby experience, which again is shared by the gymnasium as well as the theater. And the 336 theater, seat theater that wasn't supposed to be. And it had sort of fun playing around with some uniform red birch paneling and planes and acoustic treatment. The room has this really nice weird proportion to it. It's only 50 foot deep based on the, the program requirement that a deaf person cannot see signing, hand signing, greater than 50 foot. So that became a, a maximum thing. It's a very dead space acoustically, and that was very finely tuned because if you have a too live space acoustically, it causes too much interference with the hearing aids. And there's a lot of things you gotta think about with every problem, you know, be it a house, because all houses are basically, what's a house? It's basically two bedrooms or three bedrooms, right? Two baths or three baths. Um, there's a lot more, you know, there's people, there's everything. I, I think when I talk function too, I don't want to be misconstrued as meaning, you know, function. Is there a door here? Is the corridor two foot wide? You know, to me, function is the obligation to people's spirits. Okay, there's a functional responsibility of what do you perceive your environment? How do you want to perceive it? How do you want to celebrate it? What's it all about? 
you know, that's as much function as uh, I'm specifying a Kohler toilet because they always flush good for me in the past. Here you can see the fun day on this one when we put our fabric roof on. Just had two crossing arches. As you saw in that first model, I had a little trickier scheme with a bunch of tubular uh, steel things. And when I found out how my forces were resolving into the concrete, I said, hey, this is pretty dumb. I don't want everybody to drive by this building and say, hey, look what Will Bruder did. And it's really beautiful and neat, but boy, is it dumb. And this is the first insulated fabric roof in, the, in America. There's one in Calgary, uh, Canada, over a sports facility. But we have eight inches of angel hair, which is a uh, material that you've seen me use before. Uh, it's a translucent, actually, stove filter from West Virginia. And it's white, and it reduces our uh, light transmission by 1%. And there you can see the space nearing completion. And at night, like I say, it glows, and it just, uh, it's a pretty fun environment. And this is my little corporate, uh, this, is, this is for the company. The company is Mountain Bell. And they call themselves company men, and it's, you think you're working for the CIA some, or something. You know, the company, you know, and build, you build a company, and this is a company building. Anyway, this is a little play again on the sandblasted stripe deal, and it's a little 32-foot square uh, phone facilities building. It's $80,000 budget uh, with $3 million worth of equipment inside. So you no people. This is a remodeled addition to a house that somebody that wanted a very undefined geometry to live in, had been used to living in Hawaii, and uh, did most of their business in a swimming pool with phone jacks around it, which is in the backyard. <laughs> and so the, uh, the house flows inside and outside from that, and it just becomes a sculptural addition. We're going to leave the front house totally intact, so there'll be sort of this weird, geary-esque juxtaposition of this very standard track 60s house, and you walk around the new entryway through the old driveway, and you'll, you'll come upon this animal in the backyard. And this is a little resort cabin, a little honeymoon cabin up in the tall pine trees of uh, Prescott. And it's a, a south-facing little solar cave. I like to play around. I, I was always intrigued at the North Rim or any of the national parks when they use these green shingles in the pine forest. They always felt good. So just sort of covered over this little element, built it into the slope. A couple of fireplaces and a little stained glass playing around with that. And this is a little house also in the pine trees. And this is a four-story house with an elevator up that copper-clad tower in the center. And it comes rising out of the site. And uh, it's going to be sort of a fun happening. You can see the tall vertical nature. For some reason, with the slope and with the vertical nature of the site and then with the owner's program, I really felt we wanted to do something tall. And then the rear portion, again, this one faces ass backwards, and the, the upslope is the south exposure. And so that louvered element you get is a solar greenhouse at the back, as well as the upper uh, shafts there. There's five fire fireplaces and a concrete core up the center. And there it's happening. And it's bush hammered concrete with a carefully articulated horizontal rebuild. And what I'm trying to do is build this mammoth vertical structure and then make it real short by putting all these horizontal lines on it, be it copper, or battens, or reveals, or whatever. Puglia with the horizontal windows and stuff. And that's a view from the inside. That's looking into the solar courtyard behind the, the solar greenhouse and dining room, underneath the cantilevered uh, ceiling of the guest bedroom. And I'm standing in the kitchen at the left-hand slide. And hopefully another month and a half we'll have a roof on this. The fire fireplaces up the concrete core in the center, and we're hoping to build it for about 175. And here you have uh, my my homage to a little shingle cute house over in the the east part of the valley here. I was sort of taken with all those little cupolas and dormers and things, and so I just rotated a square in the backyard and created this playroom. And the owners were into barns and antiques and things like that, so I developed a little, uh, well, you can see some of the outside spaces. So a simple statement of wood and brick. And there's a transition, the linkage element is a little greenhouse insulated with that angel hair fabric I was telling you about. And there you can see the, the main truss element became this reverse king post truss. I had seen some barns once with those kind of trusses, and I thought that was sort of a trick. And so I took a two and a half inch steel pipe and two uh, three quarter inch diameter uh, rebar, and they became the bottom core to that, strapped down a couple of 12 inch glue lambs on either side, and they wrap around a couple of six by six posts, and that five and a half inch gap that developed gave me one of my skylights at the ridge. This is. Uh, house that just finishing now. I had a client last summer that came to me with a $7,500 budget in 1984, 1983. 
and um, unfortunately I've blown the budget, it's going to cost 12. And it's a little house for an artist, it's 920 square feet, it has a 10 foot diameter tower in the center, and there it is, he's living there. And we've got a little refinement, he's a potter, and we've, I've got a whole uh, scenario of Gaudi-esque uh, detailing and ceramic that will be juxtaposed on the geometry of this house. And this is the other spectrum for me right now. This is a $400,000 house in the, north, uh, the desert north of Cave Creek, Arizona. And that's a copper roof, and it's built of native stone, and it's also happening. We have a beautiful old Italian stonemason who quoted us a bit of $11,000, and the stonework is now costing sixty-five. dollars And uh, yet the stonework is so beautiful that neither the owner or I are displeased at all. It's an unbelievable thing. I like. I don't like to show mortar when I lay stone. I think there should be an artist and a craft about stone laying still existing like it did in the old days or in Japan or whatever. And uh, So when I lay stone, I either play the rubble masonry game, it seems like, or I lay stone this way. And uh, fortunately, we've got Joe and the stonework's happening and it's magnificent. We've quarried the stone from a site six miles north of the house. It's a 4,000 square foot dwelling. It's built into the slope with the south exposure. And hopefully it blends with the site. Uh, Typically in my buildings, you know, the site, you know, I don't know what's more important, the client or the, the site of a natural site, or the, the topography and the vegetation of a natural site. Uh, in my own studio, there's plants growing four inches from the footings that were there when we built the building. You know, I, I just raised fifths. I mean, it's, uh, it's almost paranoia in a way, and I realize, though, that it doesn't take, you know, I'm, you know I want to be reasonable. I want to give the contractor enough perimeter to do his job and do it right and well, I realize we'll pay a little bit more for it, but the benefits are so great in respecting it. You know, here we had to put the swimming pool in and we just sort of backed our way up the hill. Uh, that berm and the slide at the right there under the cantilevered entry off to the, the, the right-hand side of the entry view, we landscaped that um, when the block was just laid up prior to any stonework starting prior to the roof being framed. That was landscaped. It's got a year of growth on it now and the building blends with the desert. Here you have a truss roof system, okay, a little more sophisticated in my old age with the uh, trusses there or off the 2x4 jag and uh, we're into steel pipe and uh, uh, fine rods that are, are brass plated, well brass plated. And uh, it's interesting with clients, uh, just a small story here, this client came to me as a result of seeing Dr. Johnson's house which is the one with the 14 car parking problem. And they saw this house, they were taken up there by another architect that had been familiar with my work, and when he knew they had this site, he said, I was the architect that should do their house. And these people come to you, and you, uh, they've got money, and they've got a beautiful, beautiful site, and they start asking about Dr. Johnston's house, and they really liked it, they responded to the copper and the concrete and the forms and the way it related to its site, and they, they liked all those things. But what's happening inside Dr. Johnston's house? You know, where's the wallpaper, what, is, what things happen inside, right? And they were talking chair rails and cove moldings and all this good stuff and wallpaper. And I proceeded to explain that the interior wall finishes are exposed area of concrete and some of the woods and things like that. And they couldn't quite picture it, so I proceeded to send them around to some of my built projects. And my clients, you know, I respect their privacy and yet there's certain ones that enjoy showing off their houses and other ones that I know are there when I need them to, to, to help me or to, to sell or whatever, whatever the right word is. And they made the tour and they came back with their likes and don't likes. And one of their big don't likes was steel trust roofs. They didn't like it in my studio, they didn't like it in the flat house. Uh, and when we got to the site, you know, their lists of do's and don'ts still hadn't convinced me. I didn't really feel comfortable with this couple, and they're very nice people, and I had no real rationale. So I met them up at the site, and as every client, they have their scrapbook, be it Sunset Clippings or Architectural Digest or whatever it is. And people come to you with drawings, and again, all they're feeding you, you know, they aren't saying, this is what my house is, you know, this is what you build for me. And most architects will take that to mean, you know, that's what it is. Uh, but that's, uh, yeah, more water. We're almost done. <clears throat> but anyways, I didn't feel real comfortable. I looked through their scrapbook, and here were all kinds of things. I could sense, though, that they were telling me things. They liked a certain scale. They liked a certain relationship to materials. And all of a sudden, I'm halfway through this thing, and here's a picture of Bruce Coff House that was clipped out of Architectural Digest, the, the turkey rancher's house up in Minnesota with an orange indoor-outdoor carpet roof and some very beautiful stonework. Now, any client that was sensitive enough to see beyond the orange carpet roof and all the dipsy doodles of the you know, late period Bruce Goff and say this is something we can relate to or like, you know, there, there's, there's hope there. I mean, there, there's definitely, you know, and right that one photo said, hey, these people have a lot inside of them and we can work and we can have happiness, you know. 
and the house you see developed. And touching on the trusses just for a moment, you know, I, I didn't want to go against their wishes. Thank you. But damn it, when I... Split ridge or five foot by nine foot of plan. You know, I wanted to create a tension of this lightness of structure and floating versus the other, and I needed something for scale in this, 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 this space. And so the trusses were the right answer. And I went to the presentation, I had an interior rendering and I had the exterior renderings. And again, some of you have seen my exhibit over there. I typically, those models that you see aren't done for eye wash. Those aren't fancy show -em models. That is a basic architectural model in my mind. Okay, if you don't do a model that good, you don't deserve to be an architect. I mean, it's a sales tool and a design tool. It lets you know if you know how to build your building, how to put it together, and it works as a sales tool because you can visualize it and your client can visualize it. And the key is that I've never seen an architectural school that shows you how to build a model or you never pick that up. I was fortunate. I didn't go to an architectural school in the first office I worked in. The first thing I got thrown into was building a model. And the people knew some tricks, and I followed those tricks because they knew that if it took too long to build a model, they couldn't afford to do it. You know, and it wasn't just games and models for magazines. It was models for clients and to understand their, their building process. So I had that good fortune. And just those models you see over there, you know, weren't done for this show or the show in Tempe or whatever. Those are the design models that happen, and I won't present a design without a model. I will not go to a preliminary meeting. I've done it a couple times. Uh, first time I did it, I sort of knew it was wrong. It was proved so, and I did it one other time in my life, and I hopefully, knock on wood, will never do it again, no matter what. But anyways, I went to the presentation, had all these tools to, to show it. We went through the whole house for an hour and a half, two hours, right? All of a sudden, Fred says, what's holding up the roof? Glad you asked. And I proceeded to unroll the interior rendering that showed all these pipe trusses. And immediately, his eye focused on it. And as I pulled that out of the bag, you know, five minutes after I was there, it would have been dead. It would have been over with. I left. The owner called his architect friend, you know, a little moral support, you know, what's this all about? Uh, Kathy, his wife, said before the evening was over, oh, their light is there, you'll never see them, they just float through the space, couldn't be anything else, you know, and I, I told the owner, I mean, again, it was, I wasn't doing it just in spite of them or because I was on a thing that I had to have these trusses, but it was the right solution. I said, hey, we can put steel up there blind, we can put a glue lamp up there, but it's not right, and I couldn't show you something that I didn't feel was the ultimate. You know, if we have to regroup to that, maybe we can think about it, but I'd really like you to sleep on this a little bit and think about it. You know, be convicted, you know, believe in what you're doing, Show that it's worked out and thought out. You know, and again, the drawings you see over in the exhibit, those are first run preliminaries. That's the first thing a client sees. Those drawings, again, weren't done for presentation or magazine or exhibit. Those are the basic drawings you see in my exhibit. That, you know, that's my craft and my art. And this is our house up in the desert. My wife and I own 20 acres of desert in New River, which is about 35 miles north of the city. And we own the land for a while. And in 1975, in the middle of the start of summer, we decided this is dumb. We're picnicking and camping here, and why aren't we living here? Didn't have any money. Nobody would give us a mortgage because we're out in the, the sticks, a bunch of Okies. And uh, we've got the state as the neighbors on two sides, so it's a nice isolated parcel of, of high, high Bajada Desert. And was finally able to convince a lady to give us $10,000 on a property improvement loan. And we spent a whole bunch of that on a well. And we, I had a short construction period, and a friend, uh, two friends, one is an architect over in Malibu here, and uh, another that was that fellow that was up on the roof of the Adobe house. So I had a labor force, a prime labor force of four, my wife, myself, and two friends. Uh, I had about 15 friends out for the first weekend, but the temperature was 120. We started construction on August 9th. And they all thought it was really crazy. They, they basically knew it, but this was the last straw. So the next day, I just had a very small workforce. And anyway, the short story is that you know, my wife, two friends, and myself built the house in four weeks at $12,000 cost, and we moved in Labor Day. And I had the good fortune of having to film in the camera when there was a weird storm, and that's why the slide is on the left. It's uh, seven, about 840 square feet. It's a split scheme. There's a, a breezeway down the center, a bunch of raised deck, which extends our living area. We sleep out there a good part of the year, eat out there. It's like a studio apartment. My first uh, office up in the desert then is up above there where it says studio, and there's a six-foot breezeway, and then you have a living and dining bedroom situation, a kitchen workspace, bathroom, and dressing room, and the geometry relates again to function in that those functions like dressing room and bathroom just naturally want it to be smaller, and so this tapering funnel-shaped geometry uh, happened. Uh, corrugated metal was used on the house. I used it on a little addition I did to an apartment where I had my first studio. 
you can see the different views. We occasionally we've had rain, uh, snow two or three times since we've lived there. The addition uh, of wood there is a animal run and kennel, a bunch of pets. One's uh, the, the concept again was that we had four weeks to build it. We didn't have any money to build it. So what do you do? So it became simple frame construction. We put down ten um, sonotube piers, floated the house on those. And you can see the north view there, the breezeway, the view from the decks, trellising, the living room. Experiments, you know, uh, galvanized metal floor. It's an experiment that didn't work out. It's failed after eight years. Uh, Considering it was about 18 cents a square foot to put down at the time, uh, it fit in the budget, it fit into what I thought was a functional requirement and program. We're now replacing it with something else. Uh, you know, uh, the air, uh, swamp cooler lives underneath the house, the exposed sculptural duct, the little curved metal uh, hood, the CDX plywood for the ceiling structure on the beams, radio insulation, sliding barn doors to get out. Uh, the little shower is a half semicircular curve of insulated angel haired fiberglass. The metal cylinder in the bathroom is a medicine chest view from the original drafting room and on the right hand slide you see my new studio which is about 70 80 feet from the original house thought I'd expand the house first but uh, the work became a little greater need and the studio is now twice as big as the original house it took three months to build and uh, did most of the work myself and the gentleman in the plaid shirt was the concrete former that did the curves for me at Rocky so he helped build the curve form and I did all the straight concrete and steel work and like I say it took a little longer it was carefully carved into the site it doesn't float it just it, it's it's sculpted into the site. There's no landscaping added to those photographs. That's the way the building was built. There you can see the relationship between the old and the new. The idea of growth, again, uh, this building will grow. It won't grow as it's shown in the model over in the exhibit. There was going to be a curved apse at the west end. Uh, I've got some different plans. It's been about eight years and six years since I designed this studio, and uh, I've got a whole new thing that'll happen now to the west as it grows. Expression of structure, expression of light, steel, Fairly pleasant place to work. The studio, little details. And that's a little bit of what I think architecture is and what it's about for me. Thank you. I'd be happy to, like I say, here, and otherwise, if you want to wander over to the gallery now, that might be the best thing. Any? Okay.